I'm really excited about today's video. It'll be the first in a series that I'm calling How to Play Ambient Guitar. We'll be looking at both basic and advanced concepts, things that I've learned over the years in terms of how to play ambient guitar. In today's episode, we're going to be looking at how to set up your rig for ambient swells. So, grab your guitar. Let's get down to it. Okay, in order to follow along with this tutorial, you're going to need several things. First thing will be an amp either a real guitar amp, or if you're like me, an amp simulator or some kind of amp modeling unit. Your choice. Next thing you'll need is actually optional. It's a compressor. Um, and what you'll do is plug your guitar directly into the compressor. Second in the lineup is another optional effect pedal, and that would be an overdrive unit. I suggest an overdrive unit. Not a fuzz, not a high gain metal kind of pedal. Anyhow, connect the compressor to the input of the overdrive unit. The third item is critical, and that is a volume pedal. I use a Morley Little Alligator. You can use whatever brand you, you prefer. Could be an Ernie Ball, whatever it might be. Take the output of the uh, overdrive into the input of the volume pedal. The fourth pedal is uh, some type of delay unit. What you see here is a, dig, a Strymon dig unit, but if you don't want to use something that elaborate, you could certainly use something simpler like a Boss digital delay. Again, your choice. Connect the input of the delay to the output of the volume pedal, and then take the output of your delay directly into the guitar amp or the amp simulator unit. All right, now that you've got everything uh, set up, hooked up, ready to roll. Let's get ourselves a guitar tone to start off with. First, use your amp or your amp simulator, your amp modeler to uh, dial in a nice clean tone. Something like this. Great. The next thing you'll want to do is dial in some delay. This is where we're going next. So if you recall, the delay is at the end of the chain right before your signal goes into the amp. I would suggest setting up a delay at least initially at about five, six, seven hundred milliseconds. If you do have a couple of delays, you could hook them both together and set them to slightly different times. We'll look at that more on another episode. Um, and then what you'll want to do is maybe set the mix up to about halfway, so half dry, half delay. And then set up your repeats Start out slow, but set up your repeats fairly high so you get a nice long delay tail. Here's the way I've got mine set up. Let me play just a couple of single notes so you can hear it a little better. Now you might be thinking, hey, wait a minute, you have two delays, and I do because it's the dig. Let me turn down the second one so you can hear just the one delay. Oh, sorry for the out of tune there. Okay, so you get the you get the picture. Next thing we're going to want to do is start playing around with our volume pedal. This is going to give us the swelling sound. So I'm going to pull the volume pedal down, and I'm going to play a chord and just bring up the volume pedal. If you've never done that before, if you, if you don't have experience with a volume pedal, you'll want to spend a little time practicing that to coordinate uh, the strumming of the chord with the bringing up of the volume. And each volume pedal is a little bit different in terms of the taper of the volume control. In other words, the ramping up from 0 to 100. So you'll need to play around with that. Get something that feels good to you in terms of... Uh, you know, just working with a volume pedal. Um. 
once you've got that down, that that's really the basics. What I like to do is very quickly show you a couple of options that can really kind of enhance the uh, the volume swell itself. So the first one is the compressor. I mentioned before that uh, compressor is good to have. It's it is optional, but it, it's good to have. The reason why is it will a compressor can give your clean tone additional sustain. So if I just play a note without the compressor, whoop. Here we go. You know, it's not bad, but if I bring in the compressor, and by the way, this compressor is set oh, about halfway in terms of sustain. Listen to this. You hear how much fuller the note sounds for a longer period of time. So when you add in the delay and then do the volume pedal swell, the whole tone gets a lot more sustain and body to it. You know, I said that was optional, but you know, I feel like it's almost required. It, it really does enhance the uh, sound of your volume swells quite a bit. Finally, um, the distortion, that truly is optional. You may not want a distorted tone in your volume swell, but if you do want something like that, it's pretty easy to add in. I suggest, as I, as I suggested earlier, I don't think a fuzz pedal or some heavy-duty, um, you know, full-on distortion pedal is necessarily the best choice. I prefer something that has a more subtle overdrive like this uh, J Rocket Allen Holdsworth uh, overdrive that I have on the floor here. But you, you may not have that model. You could use whatever you wish. Just listen, listen to the tone I have dialed up. Let me turn off the uh, compressor for a moment. So it's just a little bit of grit. And it, it's almost something that you could dial up on your amp. The problem with that is that the amp distortion would then be after the delay, so your whole delay tone would be distorted. You may not want that. I typically like a clean delay tone, so it's good to have the distortion earlier in the chain. Let me add in the compressor. And you can hear, there again, there's a little more body, a little more sustain to the tone. Now let's add in the delay and see what we get. Yeah, so you, you can hear there's quite a bit of a tail. The fullness of that tone really kind of adds to the delay. And when we bring in the volume pedal swell, I think someday I'm going to learn how to play guitar. <laughs> Sorry for that chord. There we go. All right, again, a slightly distorted tone is also good for playing lead lines with a volume pedal. So you get a little more oomph, a little more body again uh, to, the, uh, to the tone. All right, that, that's a brief overview of how to get nice sounding volume swells. I have a little homework for you um, in anticipation of my next episode. If, if you're uh, not, if this is new to you, I would suggest just doing a little practice with some chords. If you want to prepare for part two of this series, just practice with an E minor to a D to a G to a C. Very simple chord progression.
And what we're going to do on the next episode is take that chord progression and work with it and see how it can be used um, to create even nicer sounding ambient swells. So, you've seen episode one, you know we cover the basics of ambient swells. What I'd like to do today is take the homework that I gave you on episode one and expand it a little bit and look into voicing ambient swell guitar chords. Did I say that right? Guitar chords we use with ambient swells. All right. So the homework, basically I had you play an E minor, D, G major to C major, just bar chords. And um, by the way, um, if you look at my foot here, you'll see that I've got the same basic setup as on episode one. I'm going into a compressor. This is a Wampler Ego then going into a uh, Morley little alligator volume pedal, and then going into my dig, uh, my Strymon dig delay. You can use whichever compressor, volume pedal, and delay you have available to achieve a similar sound. So anyhow, let me show you the uh, homework I gave you on episode one, just to review. <laughs> Okay, it's a nice chord progression. As a matter of fact, it's off of one of my songs uh, that are on the uh, Chords of Orion Slumber album. Anyhow, um, I'll include a link to that song uh, in the video and in the description below. What we're gonna do today though is kind of break down that chord progression and try to uh, make it a little bit nicer. I mean, it sounds nice the way it is. But it's a little plain. And if you're like me and you may use multiple delays or uh, maybe you've got a chorus involved or a reverb involved in addition to the delay, things can get quite muddy uh, when you're playing full bar chords. So how, how do we clean that up a little bit? Well, the key is, in my view, not to play all six notes. The key is to play just a few notes from each chord. To, uh, to kind of accentuate the specific intervals that you're looking for. So let's do a quick review of chords. Many of you already know this, but just bear with me. Two minutes, just let me review this. So let, let's look at a C, just a standard C chord. Okay, you probably know that a C major chord is C, E, G, right? Three notes. Uh, what you may or may not be aware of is that you can change the order of those three notes. You may have a root grouping of the notes, which is C, E, G, but you can also invert the intervals. And as a matter of fact, they're called inversions. So for example, in a C chord, if I want to start the chord on the E note, I'm playing a first inversion chord. Let me give you an example. Okay, so here's the root chord. First inversion. And then if I want to take that fifth, which would be the G, and put that in the bottom of the chord, that would be a second inversion. So why am I telling you this? Well, the reason is that you can take advantage of these chord inversions and intervals to play partial chords um, as you're doing your volume swells and really kind of clean up, again, the overall tone and again, accentuate exactly what you're looking for. So let's take the, uh, the chord progression and let's clean it up. I'll add my delay back in. Let's take a look at the E minor. Okay, so if we look at the E minor chord, the standard bar chord, you know, we've got all six notes involved. But what if we took just the E? Okay, so that would be the fifth string on the seventh fret, and then took a G on the second string on the eighth fret. So that would be E and G. Let's try that. 
<laughs> it's kind of nice, isn't it? It's very clear sounding too. So I've got an E, and then I've got a G, which is again the eighth fret on the second string. All right, so that's, again, that's a lot cleaner than this. Again, they're both nice sounding, but if you want less notes and accentuated notes, playing two notes instead of six is a nice option. Now, what about that D chord? Well, you know, if we just slide these two notes down to the D on the fifth fret of the fifth string, and then the F sharp, which would be the seventh fret of the second string, we get a D major chord. Pretty nice, huh? Let's try that again. E minor. To D major. And now, hmm, now we've got to deal with the G major. Again, here's the full bar chord. I like that you may want it for your song but in this case I didn't want that full chord so maybe if I just play the sixth string on the third fret which is a G right and then the third fret on the second string which is a D so that would be a G and a D it leaves out the B so it's neither major or minor it's just kind of a modal sounding G let's try that You could also just leave that second string open and have the B, which would give you a distinct G major. Very clear sounding. Finally, we have the C, C major. Now on the song, on my song, I don't play a standard C major, I play a C9. So that would actually be, if you played a full chord, it would be C, E, G, D. So D would be the ninth, an octave plus two above the lower C. In this case, though, I'm just going to play a C and a D. So that would be the C, uh, which would be the third fret on the fifth string, and the D, which would be the third fret on the second string. Let's listen to that. I'm a big fan of ninth chords. If you listen to much chords, <laughs> sorry, chords of Orion music, you'll hear a lot of ninths hanging around because I really like the tonality of ninths. So let's try that whole chord progression together. E minor, D, G, and then C, add nine. I'm going to show you now another way to play the G chord and the C chord to kind of keep it in line with what we're doing with the E minor and the D major. So this is an alteration or an alternate version. So let's try this. G, I can actually play with a B in the bass. So that would be first inversion. So this would be your A string, your fifth string on the second fret, and still the uh, the second fret on the the uh, I'm sorry the second string on the third fret. Let's listen to that. You hear that? You don't get that low G. You get the. It's kind of it's an unresolved kind of sound. Now, for the C chord, what we can do is simply kind of move up. So I'm going to play the C, which would be that third fret on the fifth string, and I'm going to play an E. So that would be uh, the major, right? Um, which would be the second string on the fifth fret. All right. Now, let's listen to the entire chord progression with this version of the G and the uh, C chords. Isn't 
Isn't that nice? I would encourage you to play around with this. Uh, practice it a little bit. If you're not used to playing uh, different inversion chords, try this out. Now, what about the right hand? I do need to discuss that a little bit. So some of you are used to simply strumming an entire chord. And if I only want to play two notes out of the chord, I've got a problem. You may have noticed over the last few minutes that I'm actually holding the pick. Sorry, I'm looking at my camera monitor here. I'm holding the pick with two fingers, but I'm also using another finger to pick a string. Uh, we'll get into this a little bit more in future episodes, but this is really the beginning of what I call hybrid picking. So it's con a combination of flat picking and finger picking. So you've got a couple of options. You can use the thumb and a finger. Okay, so that works pretty cool. If you're like me, or if you want to learn this, you can use the hybrid picking. So let me hold my guitar up here. So I don't know how well you can see this, but I've got the pick on the fifth string and my my middle finger on the second string, and I'm going to kind of pull them together to play the two notes. Okay. All right. So you can practice that. You've got a choice. Thumb and whichever finger is comfortable, or pick and whichever finger is comfortable. Your choice. Give it a try though and, and see how you can do see how you do with that if you're not used to this. If you're already a finger picker, finger style guitar player, piece of cake. You already know how to do this. Let me show you one other thing here before we close out this episode. Once you've got this chord progression down um, with these chord inversions, you can begin to extend them. And again, if you listen to the song off of Slumber, again, I'll include the link, um, you'll hear some of the things that I do. Let me give you just a couple of examples to consider. On the E minor chord, what if I played the E and the G, as I have, but then added in a high C with my little pinky finger on the eighth fret of the high E string? So that would be a C. So let's try that, but I'm not going to play them all three together. I'm going to play the two and that together and then bring in that high C. Check this out. Let me do that again. All right. Now, what if I brought in a B, which would be that uh, E string on the seventh fret, in on the D major chord. Yeah. And what if I brought a high G in on my G chord? So that would be the third fret. All right. You kind of get the picture of what's going on here? You've got a lot of options for extending these types of chords. After you practice a little bit, you can go a little faster and... You can really begin to play around with a lot of partial chords. Again, we'll, we'll be looking at some more examples as we move along through different episodes. But this is, I think, a good first start at working with chord inversions and different chord voicings as you're looking to play ambient swells. Today's episode is all about layering chords. So we've looked at creating different types of chords and swells and you know, some really, you know, created some really great sounding things. Today, I'd like to take it another step further and start um, adding different chordal structures on top of each other to create more complex ambient guitar swells. 
All right. The uh, the example that I'm going to start out with actually comes from Aaron Copeland's Appalachian Spring. If you're not familiar with it, it's a beautiful orchestral piece that originally was a ballet. The opening uh, chords, actually arpeggios of Appalachian Spring, or Spring, sorry, I have to learn how to say that, are very famous. They essentially are an, an A major chord followed by an E major chord. Um, the E major placed on top of the A major chord. So it creates a very complex tonality. I've transposed it into a different key just for my convenience today. I'm going to play in the key of D. So that will be a D chord, which is the root or the tonic. And then I'm going to play an A major chord or the dominant chord over top of the D chord. Let's listen to it uh, just with a clean guitar. Okay, so you kind of get a feel for it. You heard uh, also on my clean guitar a little bit of reverb. What I'm going to do now is kick in a delay. I have the Strymon Dig that I've had on the other episodes of this series. Let me pull up the uh, settings for the Dig. You'll see that the time is set all the way up. That is to the right. That's about 1.6 seconds. I do recommend for this exercise a little bit longer of a delay. You'll also see that the repeats are set at about 3 o'clock. So we'll have a very long tail to the delay. Let me just play a chord for you real quick so you can hear that. Let me turn on the delay. Sorry about that. Here we go. Okay, you can hear that it's not self-oscillating, but the, uh, the delay tail is quite long. This is going to help me out as I play this arpeggio from Appalachian Spring. Let me go ahead and do that, and I think you'll like the results. Here we go. I don't know what <laughs> I don't know what you think, but I think that's a rather beautiful, complex chordal structure as it just kind of fades into the distance. And hopefully, your mind is going now to places, um, different places where you might be able to use this type of thing. Let's try the same chord progression, but let's try it with minor chords. So D minor to A minor. Here we go. Still, very simple, but very complex in the overall tonality. Let me try one other uh, chord uh, combination while we're on the subject. Let's go from D add 9 to C add 9. So let me turn off the delay for just a minute. So what I mean by that is we're going to go G. I said D, didn't I? Sorry about that. G add 9 to C add 9. So we're going to play, I'm going to play a G with the ninth added. So that would be uh, six, string, six string third fret. Sorry, I can't talk today. The D string. And then the G string fretted on the second fret. So that would make it an A, obviously. And then we'll play C add nine, which would just be the fifth fret, uh, fifth string on the third fret, followed by the second string or the B string on the third fret. Okay, let's listen to that with the delay, and I'll make sure that they're layered. Here we go. That's nice too, it's a totally different tonality. You'll also notice that I didn't play arpeggios. 
I just played the chords. I used my hybrid picking technique that we talked about earlier. We'll talk about that some more in future episodes. And I just play the, the chords quickly, one after the other, to layer the chordal structure one on top of the other. All right. Is your mind now really going? I hope it is. When I play around with these types of things, I, I always come up with some combination that really just kind of speaks to me in terms of the chord structure. Let me, uh, let me spend a few minutes just playing around here with a few different combinations, and let's see what happens. I'm going to start with a B minor, and we'll go up to an F sharp minor, and uh, see where we go from there. On today's episode, we're going to begin exploring the very large topic of playing melody lines and leads in the context of ambient guitar. So let's, let's get right down to it. So let's talk ambient guitar lead playing. What I'd like to do on today's episode is just cover setting up and starting with clean ambient guitar lead tones and lines. Let's check out the setup first. If you look at the inset, where, wherever I've got it in the video, you'll see that I'm using the same three effects that I've been using throughout the series. I've got a Wampler Ego compressor followed by a Morley Little Alligator volume pedal, followed finally by a Strymon Dig. And my tone is a clean Fender tone. So check this out. Not too crazy. And if you listen to a single note, you can hear the compressor working to give me a little bit more, little bit more sustain. I've got the guitar set on the bridge pickup. I could set it in between. That might be nice. But I'll leave it on the bridge. The other thing... Um, this is my personal preference, is that I never run for, for leads. I never, ever run the tone control all the way up because, to my ear, things always get too tinny. I prefer a more mellow setting, so I actually roll the tone control off back to about four or so. This is going to vary depending on your guitar, but I encourage you to play around with the tone control to get a, uh, a sound that you like. Finally, the dig is set up to about a one second delay. Whatever kind of delay you have, just set it, up, set it up in that area. You'll be fairly close to what I've got going on. The dig does have that second delay line, and I do have that set up to a, a dotted quarter follow on. So let me, uh, let me let you hear that. Okay, so yeah, it's a little bit rhythmic. If you, if you don't have the kind of the dotted eighth, dotted quarter kind of capability on your delay, no worries. Just tap in about a one second delay, crank up the repeats until you like the sound, and you're going to be somewhere in the same ballpark of what I've got going on here. What I like to do is just start out with a very simple line, and uh, it's based around the E minor chord. We're going to be playing the D string on the second fret, that's an E. <laughs> the G string on the 4th fret for B, and then the G string on the 2nd fret, A, 
and then the B string on the third fret, D, and then an E, which is the fifth string on that uh, B string. And here's what it sounds like. So we're going to be doing the E, B, D, A, E. And you can probably rip that off really quickly. But let's go ahead and add the delay and the volume pedal into the mix and try it just at a very slow tempo. All right, if you don't have a lot of experience with playing ambient lead lines, you'll want to just kind of practice that over and over again with a couple of variations maybe just to get the foot hand coordination. So you're not chopping off notes or you're not allowing the pick uh, attack to come through when you play the guitar. And this is ambient guitar, so we're not going to be playing, you know, you know, that kind of stuff. And I don't know how to shred, but if you know how to shred, you know, we're not going to be shredding or anything like that. We're going to be playing slow, but in order to really work on that foot hand coordination, I'd encourage you to take it a little bit faster. So something like this. Yeah, just work on that, different tempos, until you, you've got it nice and smooth. That's going to set you up to play all types of clean lead melodies. All right, now, next, and, and I think really the final topic for this episode is intervals. So, again, we're not, we're not, pl we're not shredding, obviously, and, and we're not playing the same types of scale or intervals you might find in other genres of music. Yeah, we're not going to be doing that kind of stuff. Right, so uh, part of the reason why we're not other than you know, the fast tempo not really fitting the style of the music, is when you've got a lot of chords going on, dense, echo, delayed chords. If you're playing lead lines with very close intervals, it can actually get lost in the overall texture of the soundscape or the drone. So I find adding space between the intervals of the melody can be very helpful. Let me show you what I mean. And if I go to the upper register of the guitar, it's, it works really well there, too. And if I crank up the repeats a little bit and add in a drone, Okay, so those wider interval intervals, I can't speak today, leave a lot of space for what's going on within the chord 
or the drone, or in particular, the lower tones of whatever you've got going on. On today's video, we're gonna see how to set up a uh, distorted guitar tone. And then we're going to look at some ways to practice using that distorted guitar tone. Let's get right to work. The first thing you're gonna wanna do is set up a good, clean tone. So let me show, let me uh, let you hear my tone. You can pretty much use any kind of amp or if you've got an amp modeler like I do, whatever your preference is, maybe it's a Fender style, Marshall style, Vox, you know, whatever, uh, you know, whatever you prefer. I would set up a clean tone with possibly just a little bit of grit. You can hear there's, there's just a little bit of dirt in there. Okay, the next thing you'll uh, want to think about is a compressor. I've got my Wampler Ego compressor set to a, a pretty low level of compression, just enough to squeeze the sound a little bit and give me a little bit more sustain. So let me, uh, here, here's what it sounds like. So you can hear that the compressor is squishing the sound. Next in line would be a distortion pedal. Again, you can use pretty much whatever distortion you have. I would just give a couple of caveats. The scooped mids, kind of more metally type of distortion pedal, may not be as effective for lead playing because it does de-emphasize the mids. Uh, the mid-range of your tone, and that's actually where a lot of definition comes for uh, single string playing. Um, what I've got down on the floor here is a radial tone bone. I selected that uh, distortion pedal for this video because it's got a wide tonal range. Um, let, me, uh, let me go ahead and engage it let, and just listen to the basic tone, and then I'll tell you about how I got it. If you've got a full-on Marshall amp, you may be able to get a tone similar to this just from the amp. So it's a fairly amp-like kind of um, overdrive. And the way I've got the tone bone set up is uh, the tone bone has a top end switch. So you can think about it as kind of the treble section. It's actually set to a dark mode to de-emphasize the treble and then I've balanced it out a little bit, but it's not a real trebly sound. There's a little bit of, you know, you can hear the definition, but it's not uber trebly. The other thing the Tone Bone has is a very flexible mid-range uh, section. So what I've done is actually bump up the mid-range quite a bit. So it's pretty mid-rangey sounding. Okay, again, I do that because I feel that I get better definition in single string playing. And then in terms of the low end, it's about in the mid on the tone bone. You want to watch it. Don't get it too bassy again. That will lose definition. I do have a fair amount of gain dialed in. But again, this is more of an amp-like uh, distortion. And if I roll off the volume control, it does clean up. Now, your distortion pedal may react a little bit differently, but you'll need to kind of figure out where you like the distortion level for what you're going to be playing. All right, if we add in the Wampler, the compressor, you'll hear that the sustain level kind of goes up. Okay, so it's just a little bit of compression. Don't go overboard, but just kind of compress it a little bit to even out your tone. The next thing I want to just mention is for me, I, for lead playing, I actually turn the tone knob on this guitar almost all the way off. I'll typically run it at about two, and that would be uh, for both the uh, bridge pickup and sometimes the bridge and the neck pick up together. 
Okay. Uh, again, you, your guitar is going to vary wi- wildly or widely. Maybe you have a Telecaster or a Stratocaster, very, very different from this guitar with two humbuckers. But I would encourage you to play around with the tone knob and don't be afraid to turn it down. That's going to roll off the top end and again, uh, give you a nice definition to the string by reducing some of the overtones in the string sound itself. All right, so next thing you'll need is a volume pedal. Um, If you've been following this series, you'll know that the volume pedal is a core element of the ambient guitar setup. I'm using a Morley Little Alligator. What you'll see next in my signal chain is a Ditto Looper. I'll be using that in a few minutes, so we'll get to that. And finally, a delay. As I've used in all the other videos in this series, um, I've got a Strymon Dig on the floor and I've got it set to about a a one second delay or so. The Strymon does have the two delay lines, totally optional if you want to run two two delays or something like that. But I do have a little bit of a um, a dotted eighth thing going. Uh, Let me engage the delay and you can hear what it sounds like clean. And I do have a fair amount of uh, repeats, so it does delay quite a bit. All right, so that's the basic, those are the basic components for the sound. Let me put it all together and let's hear what it sounds like. I'm going to be using the volume pedal again to kind of chop off the attack of the string. I'm going to start on the bridge pickup with the tone on tone control on about two. So here we go. All right, the alternate tone that I use is both the bridge and the neck pickups, and I do many times roll the tone all the way off. So let's listen to that. It's interesting, on this guitar, and again, it may vary depending on your guitar, when I've got the tone control rolled all the way down and both pickups on, I actually get more high-end, uh, more higher-order overtones to the sound kind of cranking through that distortion. I think it's really interesting, and it's very mid rangey I actually think of it as kind of a mid-range honk, if you will. I like it a lot. So I, you'll, if you listen to much of my music, you'll hear it kind of all over the place in the lead tones. All right, so that's the lead tone. Let me play it just a little bit, just a little bit more. Okay, great. So I've got my tone, but how am I going to practice? Well, that's what the ditto, the looper, is for. Um, I've found a, a way that I really like to practice is use a looper or maybe on my recording software set up a loop of something very simple and just kind of jam to it. I, I get a lot of ideas that way. So let me go ahead and do that and let's kind of... Let me knock that out here, okay. And uh, let me go ahead and set up a loop and I'll start playing to it. And you'll kind of hopefully hear what I mean.
right. You can, <laughs> I can do that for like a long time. You know, kind of get your head in a place and just kind of go with it. I really recommend, though, something like that to just work up some ideas. One of the things you may have heard me doing is not playing a lot of notes right next to each other. And this kind of is in keeping with um, episode four of How to Play Ambient Guitar, where I mentioned in clean lead playing, it's kind of interesting to use wider intervals. So again, you know... Okay, sorry about that, but you, you get the picture. So I'm using octaves, fifths, ninths, wider intervals mixed in with notes that are right next to each other, more scalar types of elements. And again, I think that helps, can be very helpful in providing space in what you're playing. We've got a lot of delay going on, a lot of reverb. Things can get really muddy if we're not careful. In this video, we'll be taking a simple ambient guitar lead line and personalizing it by applying various phrasing techniques. I've got a simple melody here for us to begin working with in terms of applying phrasing techniques. So he, let me just play it for you real quick with just a simple clean tone. We're going to be applying effects from our lead guitar tone, but let's just try the melody first. So he, let, me, let me just play it real quick and then talk about it. Okay, the melody is based around A, so it's in the key of A, and we're going to be starting this melody on the seventh fret of the D string, which is the, the A. We're going to go up a fifth, which would be the G string on the ninth fret. Right, so that's an E. And then we're going to go up to a, a G, which would be the... Uh, what is that? The eighth fret, right? Ninth, eighth, eighth, whatever. Eighth fret, sorry, on the B string. And then up to an A on the, uh, also on the B string. So that's the 10th fret. fret. I'm going to learn how to talk today. And then we're going to play on the E string, the seventh fret. So B and a D, 10th fret, and a C sharp. Okay, so that's the basic melody. I won't go through the rest. You can figure it out. It's pretty simple. If you don't like that, pick your own melody. Just something nice and simple like that. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and set up with the distorted ambient guitar tone. And I'm going to add some delay in. Here's my overall tone. And with the volume pedal. All right, so you go ahead and set yours up like that and let's keep moving forward. Um, the first thing let's do is just check out the melody. I'm going to play it straight with no phrasing techniques. And, you know, that doesn't sound bad, but it is really plain Jane, isn't it? I mean, there's not much emotion or feeling to it. So let's talk about tone first. I've got my guitar wide open. On the last episode, I talked about rolling off the tone control to mellow out the sound. So let me go ahead and do that, and let's see what we get. I'm actually going to roll it all the way down to zero. Here we go. I personally like that a lot better. It feels nicer to me, a rounder type of tone. You'll want to play again with your guitar and your setup. 
All right, so let's move on to some other phrasing techniques. The first place I want to go is vibrato. Okay, so in terms of personalizing the tone, actually personalizing the melody. There are three kinds of vibrato that we need to consider. The first kind, and let me go ahead and turn this stuff off here, bring up the tone temporarily. The first kind is if you have a guitar like mine where you've got fairly high frets, you can simply push down on the string as you're playing it with a little more pressure and actually get a very, very subtle vibrato. Let me, uh, let me play that for you. You probably can't see in the video, but I'm actually just varying the pressure of my finger on the string. Okay, and it is, it is subtle, but if you add delay and distortion, check this out. Can you hear that little modulation going on that wasn't there if I just play it straight? All right, second type of vibrato is the more kind of classical type of vibrato, right? Kind of like a violin. So we're doing up and down the neck. Third type is the rock vibrato, right? So BB King, right? Sorry, I don't play like BB. He's the, he was the master. Okay, so let me roll down the tone again, engage the distortion, and let me play it with just vibrato added, and let's see what we get. All of a sudden, the melody begins to come alive. It's got a little more variation. It's a little more unpredictable because of the vibrato. I really like that. Uh, if you don't play with vibrato a lot, I would encourage you to really kind of practice with it and uh, see what you can do with it. All right. The, uh, the next phrasing technique I'd like to talk about actually involves a pick. So a couple things about picks. One is uh, I see a lot of guys and gals using very thin picks. And while that might sound good for an acoustic strumming kind of song, on electric guitar for playing lead, it's, in my view, it's not as helpful. So I would encourage you to get, if you're not playing with a thicker guitar pick, get one that's at least one millimeter. And maybe like mine, this is a 1.4 millimeter, it's actually a bluegrass uh, style pick that I really like. And I also notice a lot of people playing holding the pick, so a lot of it uh, shows up, actually a lot of it hangs down, let me hold it this way, below your fingers. And you know, that's okay. But it doesn't give you as much control over the tone. So I would also encourage you to kind of choke up on the pick so very little of it shows, let me get camera right here, shows beneath your fingers. Okay, let me, uh, let me play that again. Okay, you, once you get used to it, you'll find that you've got a lot more control over the pick. And then that will allow you to do um, a lot of things in terms of varying the tone just by changing the angle of the pick. So let me show you what I mean here. This is just a clean tone. Bring up the tone here. Now if I change the angle of the pick a little bit, I'm going to exaggerate. Can you hear how I'm, I'm changing the tone slightly? Also, if you get a little flesh from your thumb to touch the string uh, with a pick, you can actually do pinch harmonics. Okay, now when you add in distortion and delay and play the melody, whoops. Okay, that was way exaggerated. Let me play that again. I'm going to turn the tone control down too. So 
So I added some variation by throwing in some slight pinch harmonics on certain notes, in particular the, uh, the G here. And I'm not going crazy with it, but it does add a little more variation, a little bit of you know, personalization to the phrasing here. So if you're not familiar with that technique, again, just hold the pick so very little of it shows beneath the flesh of your thumb, and then pick with both the uh, material of the pick and the flesh of your thumb kind of touching the string at close to the same time. And very a little bit up and down the fretboard, you'll find some sweet spots where the uh, harmonics occur a little uh, more readily than other areas. All right, so we've got vibrato, we've got kind of pick manipulation. Now let's talk about slurring. So this is another way you can phrase. Um, instead of just playing the notes kind of up and down. We can slur the notes by actually sliding up and down the fretboard. Let me show you what I mean. So you can emphasize certain parts of the phrase, emphasize certain notes by slurring a little bit, just by sliding up and down. Now I'll give you a hint to where I'm going to next, and that is hammer-ons and pull-offs. I actually did one inadvertently there. But this is another way to really kind of personalize the phrasing of your melody line. Let me show you what I mean. Okay, so that's a hammer-on, right? We can also do pull-offs. And especially with a distorted tone, you don't actually need to pick every note. You can use hammer-ons and pull-offs to actually pick the note for you. So, Using the pick and the hammer on and the pull offs, you can get something like this. Whoop. Try that again. Cool, huh? There's a lot you can do with that. Now, finally, let's throw the volume pedal in and we'll really get some interesting personalized phrasing to the, uh, to the melody. On today's video, we're going to be looking at delays. Yes, long delays and how we can use them to create amazing chordal and melodic textures, a technique better known as Frippertronics. Let's get to work. Yeah, Frippertronics. So what, what is Frippertronics? It is a technique that was popularized by Robert Fripp, the guitarist and founder of a prog rock band called King Crimson. Robert Fripp also did a lot of work with Brian Eno, so if you're into ambient music, you'll know who he is as a pioneer of what we consider modern ambient music. And uh, what Fripp did was he actually put two reel-to-reel -reel tape decks together so that he could get long delay times using the distance between the playhead I'm sorry, the record head <laughs> and the playhead. He would actually put them together. I will include some examples of Frippertronics by Robert Fripp in the video description below so you can check them out. 
The upshot of his experiments was that he was able to get delay times of between 4 and 16 seconds. Now, mind you, this was before digital delays. This is back in the late 60s through the 70s, so a good long time ago. I remember as a younger guitar player, when I heard Robert Fripp, man, it just blew me away. So, how do we get this uh, with our digital equipment today? Well, first of all, you're going to need a delay uh, unit that can create long delays. Let me turn some stuff off here. I've got the Boss DD500, pretty new device, and it, it can create delays of up to 10 seconds. So that's pretty cool. I've got a delay set up here of four seconds. Let me let you just uh, listen to it here. All right, kind of painfully slow, isn't it? Yeah, that's gonna keep going here for a second because I've got tails set on the delay. It's a four second delay, so you might be thinking, man, <laughs> Shut up. What can I do with that? Well, actually, there's all kinds of things you can do with it if you're playing longer lines, longer notes in uh, chords or melodies. Now, what I'd like you to do, if you haven't already done so, is go back and watch How to Play Ambient Guitar, Episode 5, in which I describe a way to set up distorted lead guitar tones. And that's what I've got set up here today. And we're going to work with some distorted tones to create chords and melodic textures. So here's my tone. This, this is just plain, uh, no delay effects. Okay, so if you watched episode five, hope you did, uh, you'll learn how to create that type of tone. I've got two delays actually set up on the floor. I talked about the DD500. I've also got the Strymon timeline set up with kind of an, yeah, kind of an ambient, washy kind of delay just for some background instead of reverb. Which is, you know, that's actually pretty cool sounding. It's in and of itself, isn't it? All right, so. I'm gonna go ahead and turn that timeline on. Again, it's for that ambient background, totally optional. If you don't have two delays, uh, but you do have a reverb, you can use a reverb instead of the timeline or some other delay. Now, what I'm gonna do is turn on the four second delay coming off of the DD500, and I'm going to play a, um, basically the notes of a chord. So I'm gonna play this. I'm gonna play a G. Actually, let me turn off the, the uh, distortion for a minute. I'm gonna play a G. I'm gonna play an A. And I'm gonna play a D. So it's, it's basically gonna be a G add nine. Okay, but I'm only gonna play one note at a time with the delay on. So let's see what it sounds like. Pretty cool, huh? Uh, actually, it's very cool. So by playing one note at a time, you uh, with a distorted tone, you actually get a clean chord because each note of the chord is played separately. So you're not getting, you know, your typical, you know, you know, you're not getting your typical uh, distorted kind of power chord kind of thing. You're getting a you're getting a clean chord. It's three distorted tones. They're, they're being held out and sustained by the delay itself. Huh. Well, let's think about that. What could we do with that? What if we changed chords? So what if we played a G chord and then moved to a C chord using that same technique? So let me go ahead and play these notes for you 
just clean with no delay so you can hear what I'm going to play. Again, we're going to do the G, A, and a D. Okay, so there's our G chord. And then I'm going to play a C, an E, and also D. So that's a C9, right? Okay, and let's hear what that sounds like. With all the goodies turned on, here we go. So pretty cool, isn't it? You can, uh, by using the longer delay, you can have your chords kind of blend in to one another and create this wash of chords over time. Now, I, did, I do have my delay set pretty high on the repeats or the feedback, and you'll want to adjust that to taste a little more, a little less, whatever you're trying to accomplish as you're playing around with this technique. All right, so. What else can we do with this? Well, if you've got a delay that has a freeze um, button or a hold button that allows you to kind of freeze the delay in place, you can create a chord through this Frippertronics effect and play lead over top of it. Now, the Boss DD500 does indeed have a hold effect so that you can play, some, you can play a little bit have the delays kick in, and then you can hit the hold button, and it will just repeat the delays forever. Okay? So I'm going to go ahead and create a chord background, and then I'm going to play some delay, uh, play some leads, not delays, play some leads over top of it. And I'm going to turn the timeline back on so we've got that ambience going. So let's check that out. I'm going to, I'm going to kind of play in E minor. Here we go. On today's episode, <laughs> it's just going to be short and sweet, I want to share with you a practice technique that I use that I really feel has helped me over the years, and that is playing with your eyes closed. So how many of you are addicted to either looking at your left hand or your right hand when you play? Hmm. And if you can't look at either hand, whichever one you're addicted to, how often is it that your playing suffers? Well, there's a cure for that. That is simply to not look at your guitar when you play. Think about the great blind musicians like Stevie Wonder, for example. They don't have the benefit of sight, and yet they play incredibly. So those of us who have sight can do the same if we practice a little bit. Here's my secret to practice. Yep, a hat. Here's all you need to do. Put it on over your eyes. Let's check it out.
there we go. Don't have hat head, do I? <laughs> Anyhow, try it. If <laughs> I know, it's really stupid, right? But give it a try and see if it doesn't improve your playing. Now, it's gonna be a little hard at first if you're not used to it, but just persevere. Give it a couple of weeks and I guarantee your playing will improve. Your phrasing will be more natural. Your hands will fall on the fretboard where they should. Your right hand will know where the strings are. In today's episode, we're going to look at a picking technique called hybrid picking. It's, it's pretty cool. You'll be using a flat pick and your fingers together. You, uh, if you're like me, you probably grew up using a flat pick for strumming or playing leads. But hybrid picking combines that capability along with your fingers. One of the things that's really nice about hybrid picking is that it allows you to isolate different strings in a way that you just can't do with a plain old flat pick. And this works out really well when you're playing ambient guitar. Let me show you what I mean here. Kind of nice, isn't it? And again, you know, how do you play this with just a flat pick? It's pretty hard to do. I end up playing all the strings, not just the two I want. All right, so let's learn how to get started with hybrid picking. It's pretty easy just to get going on it like you to focus on just a plain old C major chord. And in particular, we're gonna look at the two C's. So the low C, that would be the uh, fifth string on the third fret, and the high C, which would be the uh, second string on the first fret. All you need to do is take your flat pick and your middle finger, and you're just gonna Put the middle finger on the high C, the flat pick on the low C, and squeeze them together to play those two strings only together. And you can kind of move up and down the scale if you wish. All right, if you've never tried this before, it's probably gonna feel kind of weird. So you'll need to just kind of take, uh, what I would recommend take 10, 15 minutes a day, just practice away. You can get your volume pedal in there like me if you wish. Until you feel comfortable. After you've got that down, what I would next suggest is alternating the flat pick and the middle finger just in playing the notes. And again, you can still use this plain old C chord. Let me show you what I mean. Start slow. Not too bad, right? It won't take you too long to kind of get that down. What you can do after that is then work in the ring finger as that third string. Now, what I'm gonna do is stick with the C major chord, but I'm gonna add that ring finger in on the high uh, E. That would be the open first string. Here we go. <laughs> A 
after you get that down, you can iterate between the three uh, picking things, the flat pick and the two straight, the two fingers. What I'm going to do is play the flat pick, the ring finger, and the middle finger in just a triplet pattern. Here we go. <laughs> Oh, isn't that nice? <laughs> uh, I know it's kind of dumb sounding, but it's a good it's a good uh, pattern just to start with. And start slow. Once you've got either two fingers or three fingers down, you're ready to throw in some delay and start playing some volume swells. So I'm, what I'm going to do here is kind of go up and down the scale. I'm going to play an open ninth chord. Okay, so that would be like C major, but instead of having the uh, E in there, I'm going to just have an open ninth with a D. Okay, so I'm just going to play that chord shape up and down the neck. Um, and I'm going to play the fifth string the third string and the second string together with some delay. You can play whatever chord progression you wish, but try and find some chords that allow you to just pick certain strings out of the chord instead of just strumming the whole chord, you know, the, all the six notes. So again, if you recall from an earlier how to play ambient guitar, those little uh, chord inversions that we looked at, the, uh, the E, the D, the C, and the G, sound really nice with some delay and this hybrid picking technique. And you can kind of go up the scale there and even then hop strings. Let me show you what I mean. nice. I, there's a lot of textures that you can get using the hybrid picking technique. If you do want to kind of leave the realm of ambient guitar playing, you can get a lot more rhythmic with it too. You know, the mind kind of boggles here. Sorry about the sloppy playing, but you get the picture. Uh, you can take this hybrid picking in a lot of different ways. I've got some friends that uh, do the Travis picking style. They do it really well with the flat pick and uh, using hybrid picking. I'm not that great at it, but if you want to go that direction, you can, the sky's the limit, you can really develop it. And today we're going to be looking at how to leverage polyphonic pitch shifters to create interesting and complex ambient guitar chords. So grab your pitch shifter and let's get to work. In this episode, I'm going to be using the Electroharmonics Pitch Fork, which as I mentioned earlier, is a polyphonic pitch shifter. You're not uh, limited to the pitchfork. There are a bunch of other similar devices out on the market today. There's the Eventide Pitch Factor, the Boss PS6 Harmonist, and the Earthquaker Pitch Bay, just to mention a few. 
And what I'll do is include links in the video notes below to several different pitch shifting devices that will essentially do the types of things that we're gonna review in this video. All right, next let's just review briefly the signal chain. I'm using the same basic signal path as in the earlier episodes of How to Play Ambient Guitar. If you haven't checked out the series, go ahead and check it out. There's a lot of interesting information there. So what I've got is my guitar going into a compressor and then I've got the signal going through the electroharmonics pitchfork into my volume pedal, and then finally into a delay. And in my case, I'm using the Strymon Dig. All right, so what we're gonna do is uh, check out the use of pitch shifting in several different ways. We're going to examine octaves in use with chords. We're going to examine the use of perfect fifths also with chords, and then also, finally, perfect fourths. And what I'm gonna do is use the chord progression that I've reviewed with uh, everyone in earlier episodes of how to play ambient guitar. So let me go ahead and play that without the pitch shifter so you can just hear what it is. I, I am gonna leave the compressor and the delay on and do some ambient guitar swells. I'm gonna be playing E minor, to G to C. Here we go. All right, pretty straightforward. I'm not gonna review the chord structure. Again, if you wanna check that out, in particular, look at episode two of How to Play Ambient Guitar. All right, so how can we spice this chord structure up? The first thing we can do is use our pitch shifter to add in an octave. So I've got my pitchfork set up for an octave right now, so let me go ahead and turn it on. And what we're gonna hear when I play the chord structure is one octave above each note in the chord along with the original note. Here we go. Okay, that's kind of nice. Now, the, the chord structure is still the basic chord structure, right? But I've got that nice kind of angelic, airy high end on top. The pitchfork, along with many other devices, allows you also to create an interval below the original note. So let me go ahead and switch it over and let's try that out. Again, this will be one octave below. Now that's really nice too. Um, with the lower tone, you almost get like an organ type of effect into the chord progression. The pitchfork, again, ev just about everybody else does this too, allows you, in addition to the pitch above and the pitch below, it allows you to add both the pitch above and below to the original note. Let me switch this to do just that. Here we go, let's check this out. So we're gonna be hearing the original note, octave above and octave below. Okay, so, you know, I, I hear that um, effect a lot in many different uh, types of ambient guitar music. I won't mention any particular artists, but if you listen to an array of ambient guitar players, you've probably heard the octave effect quite often. And it, it's very nice, no doubt. Um, but with these polyphonic pitch shifting devices, you can do a lot more than just dividing octaves. So what I'd like to do now is look at using perfect fifths uh, to uh, create more complex chords. What is a perfect fifth? If you, if you know about music theory, this is old hat, so you can tune out for five seconds. But for those of you who may not be familiar with a perfect fifth, it's basically this. Um, whatever note you have, in this case an E, 
Just take that note and play on the seventh fret. So it's seven half steps above. And that's a perfect fifth. So that would be essentially, uh, you know, five notes, if you will, five, you know, regular notes above or seven uh, semi pitches above. Okay, so here, and when you play them together, uh, here's the E and then the B, which would be the perfect fifth above an E. So the interesting thing is when you play a chord with a, an interval of a perfect fifth, in essence, you're playing a chord one fifth above your original chord. If I'm playing, say, an E major, and then I have the pitch shifter on and I'm playing a full E major chord, I'm gonna also hear a B major. Oops, sorry. Let me do that again, E major, and I'm gonna hear that B major on top of it at the same time. So let me show you what I mean. I'm gonna go ahead and turn the pitch shifter on, and then I'm gonna set it to a perfect fifth. We should hear the E major with the B major on top. Can you hear that? It's, uh, let me bring up the blend here a little bit. You can, you can kind of hear it, it's all blended together. You'll hear that chord with this chord. And let me go ahead and play, just play one note. There, you can really hear it, the E and the B above. All right, so when we add that to our ambient chord progression, Okay, so we'll add it to that, and let's see what we get. I really like that. And if you listen to much chords of Orion music, you will hear some pitch shifting with perfect fifths in some of the ambient guitar swells in some of my songs. I like that a lot. In this particular chord progression, you almost get a major seventh feel when you add in the fifth above, um, this, this chord right here. Right, so that is a C, right? So let me add in that fifth. It's really nice. And the great thing is I am still only playing two notes. When I add in the pitch shifting, I get four notes, which is really great. So you still get that note separation that you want for use in delays but you get a lot more complexity. Now, what I'd like to do now is add in the, uh, the lower note, which will be an octave below the pitch shift note. So what I'm gonna end up with, at least with the electroharmonics device, is a fifth above the original note and a perfect fourth below. <laughs> All right, that, that is very nice, it's very beautiful, and it's quite complex with uh, three notes essentially being played for each note in the chord um, along, the, along the, the chord progression. So there's a lot you can do with that, and the, the nice thing about the perfect fifth interval is that you still maintain the basic uh, feel for the chord. For example, an E chord. It, with, the, with the perfect fifth above and the perfect fourth below is still going to feel like an E chord. Mm -hmm. 
So it doesn't really change the tonality of your chords in terms of what they actually are. It's still, in this case, it's an E to a G to a C, uh, but a much more complex version of them. All right, so let's move on to the perfect fourth interval. Now, so we said that the perfect fifth was the seven fret interval. Perfect fourth is a little bit closer. It's the fifth fret interval, so four tones above. So if we were to play two together, that would be an E and an A. All right, so let's hear what that sounds like. Now that is different, isn't it? I've, by adding in that perfect fourth above, I've just really changed the tonal root of the chord. So let's check that out without the pitch shifter and without the delay. Here's my E minor. Let's add in the perfect fourth. All of a sudden, the tonality kind of shifted to A instead of E. Check that out again. So it's more like an A minor, even though I'm playing an E minor. That's pretty cool. So you can use the same chord shapes, and by using something like the perfect fourth interval, shift the whole tonality, the center of the tonality of your chord progression. Let's hear that again. And now, let's hear it with the pitch shifter with the lower tone brought in. That's very complex, uh, to my mind, and it's really interesting to play around with as you're building an ambient guitar song, because you can, you can build your chord structure, maybe for the first part of the song, kick in the pitch shifter um, with a perfect fourth interval, play the same chord structure, same progression, and entirely shift the tonal center. So just briefly, let's review what we've looked at. We've looked at perfect fourths. Perfect fifths. And one octave. Same chords, three different tonalities. Well, today, we're gonna to be using pitch shifters to help us in our ambient guitar lead playing. Let's get to work. All right, I'm all set up, ready to go. If you haven't already done so, you might wanna check out How to Play Ambient Guitar, episodes five and six. In those two episodes, I focus on how to set up and play distorted ambient guitar leads. I'm using the same basic setup today, and that is a compressor into a moderate gain distortion pedal, into a volume pedal, into a delay. And then what I'm going to do today in terms of demoing the pitch shifter is I'm going to place that pitch shifter both before and after the distortion pedal because 
As you'll hear, there are significant differences to the sound depending on the placement of the pitch shifter. I'm also going to use the same pitches, the same pitch shifting settings as I used in episode 10. So that would be a perfect fourth, a perfect fifth, and an octave. All right, so I'm going to shut up and start playing. I'll let you know as we go along what the settings are. Check out all these different sounds. On today's video, we're going to be looking at alternate tunings, specifically two of my favorite alternate tunings that I use with both acoustic and ambient guitars. Let's get to work. 
All right, what I'd like to do first is just briefly review my signal chain, just so you know what's going on. This is my Carvin HF2 guitar. And uh, from the guitar, I'm going directly into a Wampler Ego compressor. From the Wampler Ego, I'm going into my 11 rack amp modeling unit, which you can't see on screen. I'm taking the effects send and running it into my Morley little alligator volume pedal. From the volume pedal, the signal goes directly into my Strymon dig dual digital delay, and then that goes right back into the effects return of the 11 rack. I've got the 11 rack set up to a Fender amp model, and here's what the relatively unaffected sound sounds like. Just threw a little reverb on there for grins, and the compressor's kicked in. All right, so let's get down to tunings. First review of standard tuning. E, A, D, G, B, E. We all know this. Right? Okay. <laughs> Let's move right into some, some alternate tunings. The first one I'd like to review is a very popular alternate tuning that's used for Celtic style guitar. Likely many of you have either heard this or used it, maybe with acoustic guitar. It is D-A-D-G-A-D, -D -D. That, that's Dad Gad for short. Very easy to get dad gad. Let me move the guitar here so you can see it in the screen. I'm just going to take the sixth string, move it down to a D. Okay. The B string, string number two, I'm going to move down to an A. And then the high E string will become a D. Let me just play the open um, uh, strings, intervals. All right, that's what it sounds like. Again, you may have already used this one. It's a pretty common alternate tuning, maybe the most common. And it's really good for ambient guitar. One of the things I like about it is that uh, if you're hanging out in the key of D, um, you can pretty much play a D in root position. All you have to do is instead of your uh, third finger on the third fret, um, put that third finger on the fifth fret. And you've got a standard D. Or you can simply put your third or second finger on the G string on the second fret and that becomes an open D. One of the things I like about this tuning, again if you're hanging out in D, is that you can very easily play melodies over top of the low D. So let me show you what I mean. I'm going to go ahead and throw some delay on uh, since this is an ambient guitar YouTube channel and let's check it out.
right. That's pretty nice. Uh, th- again, that's D-A-D-G-A-D. So let's take it one step further. This is my second favorite tuning. If you're in Dadgad, like I am right, right now, all you have to do is take what is now the low D and take that down a whole tone, in other words, two more frets, down to a C. So let me do that. Okay, and then you're going to take that uh, fifth string, which is currently A, and you're going to move that down to G. Okay. So this is th- so this becomes then C G D G A D, and I don't know how to pronounce that. C G D G A D. And it's great for playing in the key of G. It's also good for playing in the key of C and even occasionally the key of D if you don't mind kind of fretting that low C. You know, on the second fret. But uh, there's some nice things you can do with it. Let me uh, show you here just in the key of G. So the the G major now becomes third string, second fret. Second string, second fret. And a C, and a C, sorry, becomes the fourth string on the second fret and the second string on the third fret. Lots of nice things you can do there. Let me go ahead and play around with this a little bit. I actually really like that a lot. In my acoustic guitar playing, I actually leave one of my acoustic guitars tuned to C, G, D, G, A, D almost all the time so I can just kind of pick it up and go with it. All right, so why why would you use either one of these alternate tunings? Well, one thing is it gives you a nice low... Uh, low note that you you don't get with standard tuning. So I can either go for a low C in this case, or in Dadgad, I can go for a low D. Um, You can also take advantage of the uh, kind of the fifths, the tuning of the fifths here, especially in C, G, D, for wider interval chords. So that's, you can do that with the standard tuning. Obviously, you can't get a low C. You can do wider intervals, but it's easier if your strings are tuned to fifth apart. Uh, Dadgad also has that fifth between the uh, low D and then the A string. So that's, that's really nice. One of the things you do lose, I feel, is the ability to play kind of your standard, you know, uh, lead guitar kind of lines. 
with the wider intervals down down below, and then in some cases the very the very small interval between the G and the A. I think it makes it a little less amenable to complex lead playing. I do think standard tuning is a little bit better for that. Now, don't get me wrong, you can play lead guitar with either one of these tunings. It's just not as lead friendly, if you will. Anyhow, that's just a quick look at two of my favorite tunings. There are tons and tons of tu- more, <laughs> you know, more tunings than you can shake a stick at that you may want to try to see if you can find some that really suit your music and your style of playing. What I'll do is include some links in the video description below. So if you never check out the description below, go ahead and check it out. I'll include some links to different sites that uh, have uh, chord charts for DADGAD, for CGD, GAD, and then uh, sites that just have general information about alternate tunings. On today's episode, we're going to be looking at how to use drones, pedal points, and pedal tones. Let's get to work. Drones and pedal points are not new. They're not unique to ambient music or ambient guitar playing. Drones and pedal points have been around for hundreds, probably thousands of years. So I'm going to include some links in the video description below to some Wikipedia articles and such that kind of discuss the history of drones, pedal tones, and pedal points. And for the purposes of the discussion here, I'm going to use the term pedal point. And by that, I mean a single note that kind of just runs on while other parts of the music are playing over top, under it, wherever it might live. Okay, so if you've used drones and pedal points, pedal tones, if you use a different nomenclature, different name for what this is, Let me know in the comments below. Definitely interested in your experience and what you've learned about this technique. All right, so first, let's just check out what I've got going on here in terms of pedals. I'm basically using the same setup as How to Play Ambient Guitar Episode 1. So if you haven't seen that one, check it out. I did add one additional delay, and that is the Earthquaker Devices Avalanche Run. And the reason for that is just so I can get a little more complexity in the delays for this demonstration. And also, um, the dig has a nice uh, freeze function with the delay that I'm going to use to create the drone or the pedal point. And by having the avalanche run active, I can still have delay going on the rest of the playing. So you probably have different equipment than I have, and that is totally cool. Um, you'll be able to, uh, yeah, I think as I go through the demo, you'll see how you can leverage your equipment for similar results. All right, so the first thing I'd like to look at is the classic pedal point. And that simply is a low note, typically the lowest note in an arrangement that underlies everything else. It kind of undergirds everything. And it's a great way to set a mood in your music. So what I'm going to do is play just a low E on this guitar and I'm going to use the dig to create a drone out of it. And then I'm going to play some chords, just some E minor to C to D chords, and then a little bit of lead over top of that, just so you can get a feel for what kind of mood you can create with a low pedal point. Here we go. Let me try that again, see if I can get a little smoother of a, of a drone.
All right, let's try some lead now. way to, to use that low drone to set a mood. If you listen to any of my chords of Orion music, you'll, you'll hear the use of low pedal points um, on more than one of my songs. Okay, so let's kind of move ahead. What if I created a, pe- a pedal point <laughs> in the middle of the note range? Well, that's called an interior or an internal pedal point. So I'm going to do the same thing here Um, Except instead of the low E, I'm going to use the open G string and create a pedal point out of that and then play around that. Let's see what happens. You still, you still get the mood, right? It's a prob- different mood. I was playing a G instead of an E this time. To my ear, it feels a little less resolved because you don't have that low foundation um, of the low, low drone. But it's pretty cool. Um, it, to me, it adds a little more tension into the mix also. All right, so that was the interior or internal pedal point. Yep, where are we going next? Yep, high notes. That actually is called an inverted pedal point. And uh, let's, let's hear what that sounds like. I'm going to go ahead and play a high G up on the neck here. Here we go. I like that a lot too, and and I do use high inverted pedal points from time to time. One of the things you do need to, I think, you need to be a little careful with with the the higher pedal points, is if you've got a really sharp kind of tone, it can sound a little annoying in my to my mind. Uh, but if you've got a nice mellow high tone like that, um, you can really set a nice elevated. Sorry, there's my hand going up. Elevated mood in the music that kind of ri- it kind of brings everything up. So it's pretty cool. Um, finally, what happens if you combine a couple of these uh, pedal point types together? So let's try a- an inverted pedal point and then the standard low pedal point together and see what we get. I'm going to play the, the low E 
and then the high G. today's video, I'd like to look at some ways that you can leverage the interval of a ninth to add depth and complexity to your chordal structures in your ambient guitar songs. So let's get right down to work. I guess, first of all, what is the interval of a ninth? Let's just start there with the basics. It's simply one note, like that delay, with a uh, second note, one octave and one whole step above. Okay? If you put both of those together, you will get this. And obviously the octave would sound like this. All right, and if you haven't already noticed, that was a C in the as the lower note and a D is the higher note. All right, so why would you use the interval of a ninth? Well, there's there's a bunch of reasons. One is because I really like them. So you should use no, that's not the reason. No, uh, ninths are very useful for creating tension in your music. Uh, you can have a regular major chord which is really pleasant sounding, but there's not much tension in a C major chord. All right, so using the ninth then can allow you to interject some tension. So you could do it in a couple of ways. You could play a full C major chord and just add the interval of a ninth, in other words, the D, into that chord. And you can hear the tension there. That D wants to go somewhere. So maybe it wants to go. Up to the E, which would be the third of that chord, right? So remember C, C, E, G, C major chord, right? Okay, uh, there, so there are ways you can use the ninth interval within full chords. Um, what I'd like to focus on today is not a full chord. It's actually a dyad. Okay, so a full chord would be composed of at least three different notes, like the C major chord, C, E, G. A dyad is an interval, a set of notes that is less than three and more than one, so die, so two, right? So it's a grouping of two notes and it's used to imply chords. So you can do that in a couple of ways. So maybe I just have a C and a G. Okay, and that's not a full chord, but it implies a full C chord, either a C major or a C minor. So either one, it could imply, depending on the rest of your arrangement. But a, a dyad with a ninth implies a chord, but with a lot more tension. So let me play again that C with the D on top, just the two notes, uh, and then I'm gonna follow with a C major chord and listen to how it implies the C major chord, but it's radically different in a lot of ways. Here we go. Okay, a lot of tension in there. There's no fifth interval, there's no third interval, there's just the first, the C, and the ninth, 
the D. Now, what if, this is the way my mind works, what if you played a chord progression composed strictly of dyads? What would you get? So let me try that uh, for you real quick, just to give you a taste of that. I'm gonna play first an E minor to G to A. Just real simple. Again, these are just simple triad chords, triad meaning three notes to a chord. Here we go. All right, pretty standard kind of chord progression, right? Let's listen to the dyad version of that using the interval of a ninth. So this will be the fifth string on the seventh fret, that'll give me an E, and the second string on the seventh fret, that will give me the F sharp, right? So, which would be a ninth above the E. Here we go. And then I'll just move it up three frets to the G, two frets to the A. very, very different feel from and yet if you were playing with other musicians playing that chord progression you could likely fit in that dyad into the overall arrangement of the song and it would work uh, but on its own it's very different sounding Let's try one more very common progression, C, D, E minor. So six, seven, and then one minor. Very, very famous common chord progression. Or if you've watched the rest of my How to Play Ambient Guitar series, you'll know that you can use some other chord voicings to get the implied chords. Right? That was a dyad with the first and the third, actually the first and the third above the octave. So now let's try it instead of... Let's try it with the ninth. So that would be a C with a D on top and then a D with an E on top and an E, <laughs> did I say that right, with an F sharp on top. Here we go. Try the other one. Are you getting the impression I like a lot of tension in my music? The answer is yes. But I would encourage you to try some of these out uh, to see if you can inject tension into your arrangements at appropriate points in time. Now, finally, where can you find uh, these ninth intervals on the fretboard? Well, they're, it's very easy. Simply put, if you take the first string uh, on any fret and then just play the fourth string on the same fret, you'll have a ninth interval, right? So this would be uh, an E to an F sharp, for example and a G to an A. Okay, and then if you go down to the second string on any fret and then fret the fifth string on that same fret, you'll get another ninth interval there. Okay, and then finally, if you take the fourth string on any fret and then fret the sixth string on one fret higher. So if I've got my finger on the fourth string on the fifth fret, put your finger on the sixth string on the sixth fret, you'll also have a ninth. So if you practice those fingerings, you'll be able to move around pretty quickly to different chords.
talk about distortions. I'd like to share with you five things that I've learned about using distortion with ambient guitars. Let's get to work. Thing number one, don't be afraid to copy your idols, <laughs> your musical idols, that is. So for me, I am smitten, have been for many years with Alan Holdsworth. I love his jazz fusion guitar playing. I love his lead tone. And over the years, I've accumulated equipment that either he uses or has endorsed, either present or in the past. And let me show you just a few things. First of all, we have here the Yamaha DG Stomp, which is a really cool amp modeling unit from the late 90s. We have the Yamaha Magic Stomp that Alan Holdsworth used and still uses as of 2016, late 2015 into 2016. Next item up is the J Rocket Allen Holdsworth Signature Overdrive. This is the uh, distortion box I'm gonna use for the other four points that I'm gonna make, the other four things that I've learned. Pretty cool overdrive. And finally, I have here in my hot little hands, I'm holding it the right way, a Yamaha, an original Yamaha DG 1000 amp modeling unit, which has all the same great amp models that the DG Stomp and the Magic Stomp has. And the thing that's cool about this unit is Alan Holdsworth actually owned it at one point. It's pretty sweet. Anyhow, here's the point. While I don't play like Alan Holdsworth, I mean, I, you, you can probably hear some of his influence in my playing. I'm not, I'm not awesome like he is or anything like that. But the, his sound has really inspired me over the years. And it's helped me to kind of ground myself and find where I want to be in terms of a distorted sound, in terms of lead tones. And whoever your idol is, whoever you love to listen to, what a great way to kind of get a feel for how to get a good lead tone. Thing number two, you probably need less distortion than you think you need. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, you know, when <laughs> I've been guilty before of getting a distortion box and just cranking the gain all the way up. And what I have found over the years is that when you do that, you end up with, you don't end up with a more exciting sound, you end up with a more muddy sound. And let me show you what I mean. So here's a, what I think is a pretty nice distorted sound. I've got a little reverb on it, but a nice distorted sound um, without too much gain. So here we go. Right, so you're probably you you might be listening and thinking, man, that's not all that much gain. And and you're right, the uh, reverb's off. Okay, let let me turn the gain all the way up. Okay, gain, and this particular pedal also has a boost. Here we go. All right, you know, that's pretty cool. Let me throw some delay on too. Yeah, it's ambient guitar, so let's throw some delay on too. All right, yeah, yeah that's pretty sweet. However, let me bring that gain back down. With the gain down, I feel like you get more definition in the chords with, in particular, if you have delay and reverb hanging out in your signal chain. In, 
in particular, if you're recording and you've got a lot of layers of stuff going on, if you've got a really nasty, gainy guitar uh, kind of tone, in particular, if you've got more than one track going, you can just muddy up the whole thing. So use a little less gain than you think you need, and it will clean up things and clarify the, your arrangement, your overall tone, probably a little more than, than you think it will. Thing number three, consider using a compressor for more sustain. So on thing number two, I talked about not having quite as much gain, but maybe at certain points you need more sustain. So instead of pushing the, the gain staging in your distortion and the front end of your amp, consider adding just a little bit more compression into the front end of your distortion box. So let me show you what I mean. I've got a compressor going into my uh, distortion box. So if I play the distortion, let me go ahead and play the distortion just by itself. No reverb, no uh, delay. Here we go. Okay, not bad. But if I kick in a little bit of compression, check this out. Okay, and the great thing is, if your compressor is not like totally maxed out, you still get more definition in the chords. Yeah, sorry about that note there. Anyhow, you, you, get the, you get the idea. So consider that. Add a little compression in front of your distortion for more sustain, but without that massive gain staging kind of thing. Number four, mid-range. The mid-range is everything when it comes to distortion. All right, so... If you're of a particular age range, um, unfortunately I'm not. Look at my beard, you can tell I'm not. You might really enjoy heavier types of music with the scooped mid type of thing. And that's, that's way cool. That's, uh, I'm not bad mouthing that at all. Um, but it's a really different sound than the non-scooped mid kind of distortion tone, which is actually more what I go for. And mids are where clarity and articulation live. So I, again, I don't wanna, I'm not trying to say don't use scooped mid-range, not at all, because it has its place and in the right context, it sounds awesome. However, keep in mind the mids as you're composing a song, as you're arranging your music, as you're recording your music, and think about where the mids are in your distorted tone. Let me add some delay here. And what I would suggest is that more mids, to a certain point, will give you more clarity and articulation, if that's what you're looking for in your music. So, if you've got a distortion pedal with a mid-range control, take full advantage of it. Check out every setting within its range. If you don't have mid-range control on the distortion, Work with a combination of your distortion box and your amp to dial up a mid-range tone that really complements and cuts through in the music that you're creating. All right? Mids are everything. Thing number five. Use 
the controls on your guitar to optimize your distorted tone. Now, what, what do I mean by that? Well, this is a fairly simple guitar, right? So you got two pickups. I have one three position pickup selector. I have one volume and one tone. Well, what can I do with that? Well, let's just check that out. So I've got my distorted tone set up. I've got everything wide open. I'm on the bridge pickup. <laughs> it's kind of nasty, isn't it? Let's check out both pickups. Not quite as nasty. Let's try the neck pickup. Yeah, all right. Now, for me, where it gets interesting is when I start manipulating the volume and the tone knobs. So what I normally do, and I've mentioned this on a couple of my other videos, is I always roll the tone control down. And that's whether I'm running clean, a clean tone, or a distorted tone. On this particular guitar, um, with the pickup selector you know, uh, set to both, for lead, <laughs> you might freak out here, but I run the tone control all the way down to zero. sweet isn't it i well maybe i don't know what you think but i like it anyhow if i run my bridge pickup i'll typically run the tone control about I don't normally run neck pickup only, but if I did, I'd probably run it about four. Not bad. Now, if I got the tone control up a little bit more, the other thing you can do is really play around with the volume knob. Most modern uh, distortion pedals, at least in my experience, clean up as you back off on the volume control. So here's, here's full volume control. Let me back off to about five. Let's check that out. Five on the volume control. Yeah, it really cleaned up a lot. down to three. So, in addition to all the knobs on your your uh, distortion or your overdrive, all the knobs on your compressor, yeah, the knobs on your guitar. Take full advantage of all of those parameters when you're building your distorted tone. On today's episode, I'd like to explore a technique that I use to help jumpstart my ambient guitar writing. And that technique is using traditional tunes. In other words, old tunes that are public domain, they're not under copyright, they're free for all to use. 
The, the great thing is there are many different types of traditional tunes. Uh, if you're here in the U.S., you might like, for example, old-timey Americana songs from the 1800s. If you're from another country, you might enjoy the traditional music of that country. I'll give you an example. I was listening to some Syrian traditional music the other day, and it blew my mind. It was awesome. For me, one of the traditions that I really enjoy are old-time traditional Christian hymns. Okay, that's kind of where I come from. You may not come from that. That's cool. But uh, you can see I've got a trusty, my trusty, rusty, old Presbyterian hymnal. And I use it quite a bit to uh, get ideas for different uh, melodies and tunes that I can eventually turn into ambient guitar pieces. So what I'd like to do right now is just kind of give you a quick demo on how I do that. All right, one tune that I've always loved that's actually in that hymn book that I just showed you is called Be Thou My Vision. It's an old Irish tune, an old Irish melody set to some beautiful words. And uh, let me just play you the, uh, the melody itself, actually kind of a, a, an arrangement that I created for acoustic guitar. And that would be kind of step one. Learn the melody of whatever song you enjoy and, and kind of want to emulate. little sloppy there, but you get the get a feel for the melody, just kind of mellow, flowing, a beautiful, just a beautiful melody. Now, what can I do with this melody to turn it into an ambient guitar piece, or maybe even just take parts of the melody and use it to inspire me to create a new piece? All right, so first thing I want to do is set up some effects. Um, I'm using the same basic effects chain that I've used for this series. Uh, which is the Wampler Ego Compressor, a volume pedal, Morley, the Strymon Dig. I did add in the New Neighbor Immerse Reverb, just for grins. I demoed that recently, if you want to kind of check it out. Okay, so let's listen to the different effects. First of all, just the compressor. Okay, just a little extra sustain. Here's what I've got set up on the Dig. All right, um, just kind of a long trailing delay. And then here's what's going on with the Immerse. Okay, a you know, typical kind of sound for me if you've listened on this channel. All right, so let's get to work here on taking Be Thou My Vision and turning it into something different. First thing I would suggest when you're approaching a traditional tune is to get your effects chain set up and then just play the melody. So let me go ahead and play the melody here. I'll just play part of it, just kind of plain and simple. Here we go. Uh, oh, and I'm going to slow down the tempo a little bit. Okay. Now, what if I slow that way down? Um, what would that sound like? Let's try that. Like where that's going. It's pretty plain though. I need some more notes involved here to kind of flesh out the overall chordal structure. So let me do that 
that same kind of phrase with, I'm just going to use the root notes of each chord. So that would be, I'm capoed on the second fret. So that would be E, A, and B. So here we go. That's, that's kind of cool. Now, what if I spread the kind of the, the tonal range, like, I, you know, it's all in the kind of in the low end here, right? So what if I took that melody up an octave? Let's see what happens there. that so I've got a little more separation between notes it's not so muddy although sometimes mud is good yeah that's kind of cool so you can kind of play with the balance there of the intervals of your notes so wide intervals close intervals kind of you know vary it a little bit um, you can kind of see where things are going here uh, with this melody so as I kind of flesh it out. What else could I do with this? I've got just the melody with my, you know, echo and delay. Okay, and I'm also taking the opportunity to spread out the intervals. Now, what if I played some variations on the melody? Okay, so I'm going to use this melody as inspiration, and for me, I'm very improvisational in my playing, so I'm going to kind of keep that melody rolling around in my brain, but I'm going to vary it and play something a little bit different. So let me give you an example of some things that I might do um, if I were improvising against this song. the melody in there, you know, little motifs from the original melody, but I've changed things up. So that's pretty cool too. So we've got, you know, playing the melody as is at different tempos. Doesn't have to be the original tempo. It could be slower, could be faster. We've got extending um, intervals, right, to widen out the tone. We've got uh, playing around with um, variations on the melody. Now, what if we also did some variations on the chord progression? So I'm going to turn off the effects for a minute. So the basic chord progression of Be Thou My Vision is So it really, it's a it's basically a three chord progression, right? So in this case, since I'm in the key of E, capoed on the second fret, with a partial capo, by the way, it's E, A, and B. Um, nothing too crazy. But what if I added in some variations to the chord progression? So let's try that.
So I did some pretty significant variations on the, the melody there, but I also did some significant variations on the chord progression itself. However, if you compare it to the original, it still has a, that same kind of feel, that flowing feel. So I haven't deviated from kind of the, what I would call the spirit of the song. Oh. On today's video, I'd like to look at some tips and tricks for using baritone guitar in the context of ambient guitar. So let's get right down to work. The first thing I'd like to do is just review what is a baritone guitar. I've had a few questions on that, so I think that's a good idea. Basically, a baritone guitar is a, indeed a guitar, but it has, number one, a longer scale length than a normal guitar. So your average Gibson, for example, has a scale length of 24 and 3 quarter inches. Your average Fender style guitar typically has a scale length of 25 and a half. Baritones start at 27 inches, which is what this guitar has, and can go up to 28 and even 29 inches. So quite a bit longer of a neck. So what does that mean? Well, it means for one thing, uh, you can put heavier gauge strings on the guitar. This particular guitar has 012 to 068 gauge strings on the guitar versus your typical, for me, like a 10 to 46 standard light gauge string. Um, and in addition to heavier gauge strings, longer scale length, that means you can tune it down, down, down. And in fact, a baritone guitar typically sits about halfway between a standard guitar tuning and a standard bass, electric bass tuning. This guitar, for example, has a tuning of B, E, A, D, F sharp, and another B on the first string. So it is a perfect fourth below standard tuning. Another way to think about it is it's basically five frets worth tuned down. All right. Okay, so what can you do with a baritone? Well, you can play it just like a regular guitar. You can use the same chord shapes if you're in the same tuning I am, but there is a difference. So if I play, for example, the E major chord shape, I, that's not actually a, an E major. That is actually a B major. And if I play, for example, a standard A chord shape, that actually is an E major. So as you can see, everything is pushed down by a perfect fourth, or again, five frets worth of detuning. So that's one thing you need to be careful of as you think about a baritone guitar. You're gonna be using the same chord shapes, but you're not gonna be sounding the same chords. So you'll need to get used to transposing chord shapes, okay? In particular, that's important if you're playing in a band. So, but that, it does have some interesting advantages in that you're using different chord shapes to sound the chords that you normally do. So let me, let me play you an example, and it's actually gonna be, um, it's gonna look like I'm playing B minor, but I'm actually gonna be playing in F sharp minor. So let's check that out. Kind of cool, isn't it? So, I, you know, a standard guitar, I would have been playing vastly different chord shapes to get that kind of a chord progression and intervals. That's kind of cool, but you got to keep that in mind. You're going to be transposing the chord shapes you've come to know um, all these years. The next tip is related to chord shapes, um, and it has to do with the low register of the baritone guitar. So. If I'm playing a uh, what would be an E major shape, which is actually a B major, let me go ahead and play that. It sounds pretty nice. Here's the G major shape, which is actually a D. Okay. 
Okay? You, you can hear you're kind of down in the basement with this low sixth string. And if you don't watch it, things can get pretty muddy. Okay, so the tip here involving the chord shapes is use wider intervals at times to get more clarity in your chords. I'm going to be playing in the key of B, but I'm going to spread the intervals out so I've got wider intervals, I've got more high notes in addition to the low notes. Here we go. Okay, so if, you, if you're careful, you can avoid all the mud and still take advantage of the low end of the baritone. And in fact, that leads me to the next tip, take advantage of the low end of the baritone. What's really cool is you can play quite high up on the neck and still, if you're using finger picking or a hybrid uh, flat picking technique, you can get those low notes, which sound just great. Let me give you another example here. Pretty sweet, isn't it? You can really kind of spread things out and get down low in the dungeon and have perfect clarity just by kind of spreading your chords out. The next tip is that baritones sound really good with arpeggios. In other words, instead of just playing, you know, just, you know, those kinds of, whoop, those kinds of chords, um, they sound just really great, in particular with ambient guitar, if you're playing arpeggios. So let me show you what I mean by way of example. Next tip, can you use distortion and play leads um, on a baritone guitar? And the answer is yes, you can. As a matter of fact, a, a big use of baritone guitars would be in heavier types of music where you're down in the dungeon and you're playing rhythmic patterns. I don't really play that style of music, but it's very common. And a baritone guitar is a very good instrument to get down, down low without the strings getting too floppy. Uh, but in terms of lead playing, uh, it's also a great instrument to utilize. Uh, the thing to note is you can't, you know, even the strings all the way up here are going to be a lot lower in pitch than a standard guitar. But the uh, baritone guitar really excels in what I'll call mid the mid-range of pitch as you're playing lead. So let me just, uh, I'll play some slow kind of ambient leads and I'll show you what I mean. And you see, you can even bend strings. So if you're into that sort of thing, I, I don't bend strings too often, but occasionally I do. And the tension is not so great, even with the heavier gauge strings, that you, you can't do the occasional bend. The other thing you can, you can do are pinch harmonics and, you know, all the same types of things that you do on a standard guitar. I demo sweeping, but I don't know how to sweep. Sorry, guys. Uh, but if you do know how to sweep, sure, you could do that too. So it's pretty versatile. Just keep in mind that that's the highest note you're going to get uh, as you're playing lead. 
On today's episode, I'd like to discuss the the use of acoustic guitar in ambient guitar music. If you're like me, you might kind of automatically reach for that old electric guitar, plug in a bunch of pedals, and have at it. And that's awesome. But I find it really useful to return from time to time, as a matter of fact, again and again, to acoustic guitar, which for me is one of the roots of my guitar playing. And I find it really useful to generate ideas and even to generate performances of ambient style music on the acoustic guitar. So what I'd like to do today is just provide a few ideas for how to leverage your acoustic guitar in ambient guitar music. So idea number one, take advantage of either altered tunings or dual capos like I have here. And by the way, you can check out altered tuning and capo episodes of how to play ambient guitar. I'll put the description somewhere for you below. Uh, But consider the use of that altered tuning or dual capos to achieve a drone. If you're like me, uh, you may include a lot of drone tones in your electric ambient guitar music. You can do the same thing on acoustic guitar yeah, easily with an altered tuning such as Dadgad or some of the other tunings that really favor a low drone. So you can get some really nice um, melodies and chordal structures using the drone. Okay, idea number two, don't do a lot of strumming. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying strumming is bad, but if we think about ambient music, I think one, and if you think back kind of in the history, back to like Brian Eno and Robert Fripp, some of the early guys, and then how it's progressed through into post-rock concepts and then more modern and modern types of ambient music, you know, within the last 10 years or so, there can be a lot of space in the music. And if you're strumming, you're going to reduce the space between the notes. You're also going to fill the space with a lot of rhythms. And, you know, while that sounds great for folk, for rock, for bluegrass, Celtic, etc., for ambient music, I find it more useful to leave space between the notes. So you may want to use the hybrid picking technique that I've outlined before, or even perhaps a thumb pick, if you know how to use a thumb pick, along with, um, you know, regular finger picking. But leave some space between your notes. Idea number three, consider where you are picking in relationship to the bridge and the fingerboard. Okay, so it, I find this true on electric guitar, but in even more so on acoustic guitar, you can really kind of change the tone of your string by where you pick in relationship to the bridge. So, you know, you might find a lot of players picking close to the bridge. And it, it provides a, a more sharp sound, more trebly sound. Um, I find that's not bad. And I'm not saying you shouldn't use it in ambient guitar music. But I do find playing closer to the sound hole or even over the sound hole provides a warmer, rounder tone, which I think can fit in well with ambient style music.
Idea number four. Think about the type of pick you're using. I've got a couple different picks here. You probably can't see them too well in this shot. Let me hold them maybe down here. So I've got a 1.4 millimeter. It's actually a bluegrass pick that I really like. I've got a kind of a one point, I think about a 1.8 millimeter pick. That's pretty cool. And then I've got a 1.5 millimeter old, old, old tortoise shell pick that I've been using now for many, many, many years. It was actually made out of an antique uh, comb or brush set that was, you know, 100 years old, made out of actual tortoise shell. So you can't get these, to, you can't get these anymore, but it's pretty cool. One of the things you might have heard, though, is that in terms of millimeters, it's more than, the, all of these picks are more than one millimeter thick. And as a matter of fact, um, I do have another pick that I use that's actually two millimeters thick. These are pretty, pretty hefty picks. They don't really bend when you use them. Um, I know a lot of guys and gals use very thin picks to, uh, especially with strumming, because they like that kind of floppy, kind of feel and kind of, you know, having the, stri st the pick, sorry, flap across the strings. But one of the things that happens when you use thinner picks is you get more pick noise against the string. And if you're playing slowly and quietly, and you've got one of those very thin picks, you're gonna get pick noise, like really loud pick noise that's gonna be distracting. So consider using a thicker guitar pick that will actually be quieter on the strings. If you're not used to these thicker guitar picks, it'll take a little while to adjust to the thickness. But once you do adjust, you're gonna find that not only do you have less noise on the string, You'll also find when you're playing electric guitar and maybe you're playing a lead, uh, you know, lead line or something like that, the the thicker pick allows you to actually play faster, which I know is not an, not an issue for ambient music, but if you are playing a faster style of music, it does allow you to play faster, and it allows you to play faster with less string noise, and the pick. Once, again, once you get used to it, really kind of glides across the strings a lot easier. So consider using a thicker guitar pick. Next idea. Consider using hammer-ons and pull-offs in your ambient music. Okay, and you know, maybe you normally you're thinking of hammer-ons and pull-offs with um, electric guitar leads or maybe uh, faster bluegrass picking. <laughs> kind of like that, right? So you, you, we've all heard that. We've all heard hammer-ons and pull-offs with electric leads, but in slow ambient guitar music, a hammer-on or a pull-off can be very expressive. nice. You can do a lot with hammer-ons and pull-offs. So consider weaving them into your melody or chordal structure with your acoustic ambient guitar piece. Final idea for today's episode. Use the same types of chord structure and voicing techniques that we've talked about in some of the other episodes in how to play ambient guitar. So the third and fifth are great, right? Thank you. 
and oh, those ninths. And space between the bass and treble tones. Lots of things you can do with chord inversions, chord voicings, and chord spacing. Welcome to How to Play Ambient Guitar, episode 20. On today's video, I'd like to show you a really cool effect that combines hybrid picking and the use of a volume pedal. All right, so if you haven't already done so, you may want to check out episode two of How to Play Ambient Guitar, which focuses on voicing chords for volume swells. And you may also want to check out episode nine, which covers hybrid picking and flat picking in the context of ambient guitar. All right, so um, you heard the music I played at the beginning. Kind of cool. There's a rhythmic thing going on. Okay, and there's also volume swells going on. At the same time. So let's break it down and see how I got that effect. Okay, the first thing we uh, want to do, or maybe you might want to do, what I did is I set up my guitar with a clean tone. So let's check that out real quick. Okay, and by the way, this is a baritone guitar. You can do the same exact thing with a standard guitar too, or a seven string guitar, eight string guitar, whatever kind of guitar you play, this concept will apply. All right, so get your clean tone and then throw a little compressor on it just to squash the dynamics and produce a little more sustain. Okay, next you'll want to throw in a, just a little bit of overdrive. I'm using the Strymon Riverside. Again, you're not required to use the Riverside. Use whatever you have. Just make sure it's an overdrive, not a fuzz or heavy metal kind of distortion pedal. Something you can get some mellow distortion with. So here's what it sounds like on this guitar and this Strymon Riverside. Okay, so just a little grit in there. Okay, but not a lot. All right, that's the basic sound. The next thing you'll want to do is set up a volume pedal. So again, just standard stuff that we've covered here a lot. And then um, after that, you'll want to set up a delay. And what I've got set up is the Source Audio Nemesis and just listen to this delay. Okay, and this is a stereo ping pong delay. If you're listening on a stereo system, you can probably hear the delay going back and forth. If you want to use a mono delay, that is cool too. It's, it's all good. And if you listen to the delay interval, okay, so that's going to put each repeat probably at about mm, 300, 350 milliseconds because I'm tracking a little bit faster than one beat per second, 60 BPM, probably tracking at 65 to 70. Okay, so think about that, maybe about a 300 millisecond delay. And you can hear that I've got the repeats turned up, so we get maybe, what, seven, eight seconds of repeats going with the delay. And then finally, this is optional, if you have one available, you may want to throw in a little bit of reverb. 
Okay, so I've got the New Neighbor Immerse going. You can use whatever reverb pedal you may have. Could be the Boss RV6, could be the Strymon Blue Sky, Big Sky, whatever sky, whatever clouds, whatever it might be, okay? Get a little bit of reverb going, and if you do have the option to adjust the pre-delay, set it up so there's a, there is some delay. So listen to this reverb. Okay, hear how the pre-delay kind of blooms after I pick the note. You'll want to try to go for something like that. All right, so that is a walkthrough of all the effects. Now let's talk about the playing technique. We're going to do some hybrid picking again, um, episode nine, if you haven't seen it yet. Um, we're going to play just your standard six, seven uh, root chord progression. So for you standard guitar players, that would be like the classic C, D, E minor kind of thing. I'm doing this in baritone land, so it's actually uh, G, A, and then B minor. Okay, so, so this would be G, and B, uh, A, and B minor. And let me turn that delay off. Okay, so. Okay, again, if you're in standard guitar tuning, that's C, D, E minor. All right, now here's where it gets fun, hybrid picking. What we're gonna wanna do is pick the bass notes in time with the delay. So if you've got a standard guitar, hit that six string, your low E. If you've got a baritone like me, it's the low B. Just start picking that um, and listen to the repeats of your delay. Okay, so get your tempo going in your mind and imagine that the delay, every time you hear a repeat, that's an eighth note. And what you're going to want to do is pick on the quarter note. Okay, so not too bad. Okay, that's about the rhythm or the uh, tempo, I should say. Now we're going to need some hybrid picking to get that chord in. And the goal here is to keep this rhythm on your low string going. I got to learn how to play guitar someday. So we're going to keep that rhythm going while we begin to pick other strings with our fingers. Again, hybrid picking in effect. So let's check it out here. I'm gonna play the second string on the third fret, second string on the fifth fret, and second string on the seventh fret while I'm keeping the rhythm on that low six string. So the low E for standard, low B for baritone. Here we go. I'm doing. I'm also using a palm mute on that low string. Otherwise, it would be. And you know, you can do that if that's what you like. I kind of prefer the muted, so I just kind of put the palm of my hand on the sixth string by the bridge just to mute it a little bit. Okay, so go ahead and practice that. When you get that down till it's kind of smooth, you can kind of go from there. The next thing we're gonna look at is playing more of a chord, again, while we're keeping that low string rhythm going. So what I'm gonna do is add in a ninth chord here. Okay, it's, it's not a full chord, but it's the root. 
and the ninth. Okay? But I'm going to keep that rhythm going. So let's see how I do here. It'll probably be a little messy. Okay, does that make sense? So we're just gonna combine those two elements together and that's gonna give us the basis of this chord progression when we begin to add the effects back in. And we're gonna do that right now. Let me go ahead and throw the delay in and we'll try, I'm gonna try just what I played with the delay. Here we go. Gotta get my rhythm right, my tempo right. That's pretty cool. Let's throw a little reverb in there and hear what it sounds like with all the effects. Yeah, that's nice. All right, so there's there's a problem that I hear though, and it's annoying me a little bit, and that is the high string. Again, if the, if you're in standard guitar, it's a, B, a D, right? That second string on the third fret. Um, if I am just picking like I am doing, the repeats of that higher pitch is kind of annoying me a little bit. Okay, it, it's not bad, but as I was kind of putting this together, I was thinking, I'd like something a little smoother, and that's where the volume pedal comes in. So this is where things get a little tricky. Um, so I've got the inset there, so you're going to want to watch my foot in terms of the volume pedal. And basically what I'm going to do is we're still going to do the rhythm. Let me. Uh, I'm going to turn off the effects just for a minute here. Right? So I'm still going to do that rhythm, but every time I play the chord or the ninth interval, instead of just picking it, I'm going to swell it in with a volume pedal, but I'm not going to stop the rhythm on the low string. So let me, let's check that out without the effects. Here we go. Okay, does that make sense? So we're, it's actually gonna be on that downbeat, right? For, uh, beat number one of the measure, we're gonna be playing. So the volume swell is on beat number one, and then the regular pick is going to be on two, three, and four. Okay? And once we add in the delay and the reverb, it's all going to mix together. And, and because of the reverb repeat at the eighth note interval, you're not going to miss playing that one low string on the downbeat, on the one. It's all gonna kind of smear together and it'll make sense. Here we go.
like that a lot. And one of the cool things is that you can drop out the rhythm and go to just volume swells and really kind of change the texture. Let me show you what I mean here. I like that a lot. So you can really kind of play around with textures and rhythms um, using the combination of hybrid picking and volume swell pedal. So there you have it. It's kind, kind of what I might consider an advanced technique. And if you have not really played around with hybrid picking, it may take a little while to get the coordination between your flat pick and your fingers. By the way, if you are a thumb picker, now I don't have my thumb pick available, you could do the same thing with thumb pick and fingers Series. also. Anyway, on today's video, what I'd like to really look at and cover are some tips for achieving a good tone in your ambient guitar patch. So we're gonna kind of walk through several different aspects that uh, I think are important for good tone production and ultimately getting a really nice sound out of your ambient guitar patch. So let's go ahead and get started. This is where your tone production really starts. It's in your hands. It's in your hands. And so decision point number one is fingers versus pick or perhaps both. And I do have an episode on hybrid picking where you use both. That's what I'm going to kind of do today. It's, it's actually very important how you pick. Here's a guitar pick. Here's my finger. So you can hear the finger is a little less sharp, a little fuller sounding than the pick is. And that's a really important um, factor as you're playing because you can use a combination of fingers and picks. You can use all fingers, you can all use all picks and really affect your tone. That's number one, finger versus fingers versus picks. The next factor or tip to consider is if you are using a pick, what kind of pick are you using? So I've got a few here. Let's start with a very thin pick. So you can see that's very flexible, very thin. And let's just, let me just play with that a little bit. So thin picks tend to give you more of that pick slap. They also tend to emphasize the highs, the uh, treble, if you will, the upper spectrum of the guitar string. Um, if you use a thicker pick, let me grab the one I dropped here. And this one happens to be a 1.4 millimeter bluegrass pick. And listen to this here. <laughs> Let me go back to that thin pick. So you can really hear the difference. This one is a little thicker sounding, the 1.4 millimeter. Okay, and finally, I have another example. It's a 2.5 millimeter pick. Okay, sloppy playing, but you get the picture. 
the pick that you use can greatly affect your tone. Also, where you pick um, in the length of the string affects your tone too. So I'm back to the medium kind of gauge in my world. That's the 1.4. And so let me show you what I mean. So if I pick near the bridge, Versus near the neck. And then even picking over the neck itself. They all produce different tones. Obviously, bridge is, you know, emphasizing a very sharp kind of sound. As you move towards the neck, you get a lot mellower. Okay, so those are fingers and picks. Important first decisions. Next decision on the guitar itself, you've got some controls and those are going to affect your tone. You've got bridge versus neck pickups depending on your guitar. So here's the neck pickup on my guitar. Here's the bridge pickup on my guitar. Okay, so that's going to really affect your tone too. So choose the correct pickup for the type of song you're playing. If you want a sharp sound, then pick that, you know, select the, uh, the bridge pickup. If you want a mellower sound, select the neck pickup. Also, I've mentioned this on a few earlier episodes, but the tone control on your guitar can be immensely important. Um, I never used to use my tone control. I'd just leave it at 10 all the time and not worry about it. I, however, at some point discovered that if you roll the tone back on any given setting, it really mellows your sound out. And if you're careful with it, you can really use it to your advantage. So here's the guitar with the tone control all the way up. Okay, I'm gonna roll it down to about five or so. Isn't that cool? I have to tell you, I never ever run any of my guitars with the tone control all the way up. I always roll it off a little bit because I like the mellowness that it gives me. That might not work for you, um, or it may only work for you every now and then. Be aware though that that tone control can massively affect the overall tone of your guitar. All right, so I've made a couple of selections. I'm using a 1.54 millimeter pick. I've got my tone control rolled down to about five. I'm using both the bridge and the um, neck pickups. And here's my overall tone. Um, all right. So next, what I'd like to do is look at how the effects that you use affect the tone of what you're playing. So first off, if you look down at the pedals that I have arrayed, uh, to my right, probably your left, there is a blue compressor and I've had it turned on the whole time. So compressors actually can affect your tone in a fairly significant way. So let me play you uh, this basic tone without the compressor, and then I'm going to um, put it back in the, in the chain. Here we go, without compressor. All right, with compressor. Isn't that interesting? The compressor in squashing the dynamics a little bit, in this case, brings up 
the low mids and the lows a little bit so the overall tone of the guitar is fuller. Now that works for me. Again, depending on what you're playing, it may not work for you, So, but you should be aware of what a compressor can do to your tone. So once again, without... and with. Okay, that's the compressor. Now, what else can affect your tone in terms of pedals? Distortion. If you're going to color this kind of plain vanilla clean sound with a distortion, you need to be very aware of the tone controls on your distortion pedal and how they're affecting the overall tone of the signal. So let me go ahead and turn it on. And this is where I normally keep the distortion settings, somewhere in this area. And you can hear it works really well if you're doing volume pedal work with the uh, distorted tone. Okay, now, if I start playing around the tone controls, let's bring up the treble all the way. Oh, uh, I should mention right now, the bass and treble controls are about in the middle. So I'm gonna bring up the treble control all the way. All right, so for me, that's kind of nasty. Let's bring it all the way down and see what we have. Not so nasty, but muddy. Okay, so for me, just a little bit past noon is where I like it. All right, let's do the bass. Bass all the way out. Now, if you've got a if you've got an arrangement with lots of guitars, you probably want to drop out some of the bass. All right, bass all the way up. Here we go. Okay, so that's a lot. There's a lot more beef in the sound, and that can actually get a little muddy again if you've got a large arrangement of instruments. Let me put it back. All right, so that's distortion. Uh, let's move on to delays. So I'm gonna go back to my clean tone. Ah, nice. And I'm gonna throw in a delay. This is the Avalanche Run. I selected this because it's a nice, simple mono delay. So let me go ahead and turn it on, and here's what we have dialed up. So you might be thinking, okay, Bill, well, that's just a, del or a delay. What, what about the tone? Well, one of the other reasons I selected the Avalanche Run is because it does have a tone control. And I think this will help you see how different delay tones affect your sound. So right now, I've got the tone control on the Avalanche Run at about, oh, I don't know, close to 2 o'clock. And what happens on the Avalanche Run is you, be is you begin to bring the tone control up as each delay repeats, each repeat of the delay, I should say, more and more of the low end drops out. So let me bring that all the way up. And then let me just play something, you'll hear what I mean. Okay, so you can really hear how the bottom end drops out. So what does that mean? When well, you play a song with it, you're gonna hear the delay, but not a lot of bottom end, and that can keep things from getting muddy. Okay, yeah, pretty cool. Now, if we 
turn it all the other way on the avalanche run, we're gonna each repeat is gonna begin to drop out the treble and just leave you with the bass or the low frequencies. Here we go. Yeah, you can hear how that just kind of goes. Bleh. But and you might think, well, why would I ever want that? Well, if you really just want a little wash and you kind of don't even want people to know necessarily you have a delay going on, it could be a good choice. Okay. Your delay may have different tone controls. If it does have tone controls, then the Avalanche Run. But you'll be able to do something similar if you've got a low or high cut filter on that delay. So here's where I normally keep it, uh, where I'm going to keep it for the rest of this uh, episode. Okay, so we're dropping out just a little bit of the lows as we repeat. And we get plenty of repeats that way. Finally, reverbs. Many reverbs also have tone controls on the pedals that you can work with to really adjust how they react. So I've got the New Neighbor Immerse here on the floor, and it just happens to have a tone control. So let's listen to what I've got dialed up uh, in terms of a reverb. This, will, this is just the guitar and a little compressor and the reverb. I've done other episodes on the Immerse. It's a great reverb. But what the purpose of using it here, so you can hear what happens when I crank the tone control up and we end up cutting lows and boosting highs. Here we go. Listen to this. That is one sharp reverb. All right. Very sharp reverb. There we go. And um, it may or may not work for what you're looking to accomplish. So that tone control can come in handy. Let's roll it all the way down. You know, I, I like... Whoop. I like the tone of that reverb, but it doesn't really match the tone of the guitar, right? It's too mellow for the tone of the guitar. So if I bring the tone control up more towards the mid portion, it's going to match the guitar a little bit better. Okay, cool. Now, if I roll down the tone control on the guitar and maybe select the neck pickup, Let's roll down the tone on the reverb. Here, now that might be a little muddy for you, but hear how the reverb complements the tone of the guitar. So that's one thing I think, especially with reverbs, you can play around with to get the right tone. Have the reverb decay, try to match it to the tone of your guitar. Let's listen to the delay and the reverb together now that we've got kind of everything dialed in and see what we have.
Now let's try some distortion. I've rolled the tone control all the way down on my guitar. I really like playing distorted tones like that. Today I'd like to spend a few minutes looking at how to incorporate string bending into your ambient guitar lead playing. So let's get right down to work. First of all, you'll need a lead tone, a distorted lead tone, and I actually did an entire episode on that. Check it out if you haven't seen it already. Here's the tone that I'm using today. <laughs> It's basically a little bit of a compressor and a Strymon overdrive. If you don't have the Riverside, you can use whatever distortion pedal you have, and I'm sure you'll get a tone that's somewhat similar. In addition to that, I'm using some reverb. And that's just a hall room type of reverb, and of course, some delay. And as you can hear, I've got a good bit of delay going, and that's because um, for this demo, I'm going to be using the volume pedal for the lead playing that I'm going to do. And that brings me to tip number one, incorporate string bending with your volume pedal. So, you know, if you think about typical, maybe blues style string bends, Okay, that's pretty cool, but if you add in some delay and use a volume pedal with it, I think it gets kind of cooler. All right, so if you use the volume pedal to chop the attack off of your note, String bendings turn into, in my view, kind of like otherworldly sounding whale sounds, if you will, which can be really cool. So uh, there are several different, different ways you can use string bending with a volume pedal. The first one that you just heard is a bend up in pitch. Okay, and that's pretty typical. Um, if I turn off the delay, here's what it sounds like. Delay on. All right, so that's cool. Tip number two is to bend down. And this is a little trickier because before you bring the volume pedal up, You've got to get the string bend in position so you can go down. So what I mean is, uh, let me explain here a little better. Typically in a string bend, you go up and then down, right? All right. In this case, we're going to start in the up position of the pitch and go down. Okay. And that sounds really cool with delay and a volume pedal.
And it's kind of nice if you've got a, uh, say, this E, this, uh, e here, the uh, B string on the fifth fret. That is a fixed note, right? It's just fretted. So if I play that note, and then the next note is my uh, the same E, but on the third string, bent up, you know, essentially a whole tone or two frets worth of pitch. It's kind of cool um, in terms of the effect. Anyhow, that takes a little bit of practice. Um, I don't, <laughs> you know, as I play, sometimes I'll record and use it. Sometimes I have to go back and do two or three takes to get it right because it can be a little tricky in particular if you don't, uh, if you don't practice that a good bit. But give that a try and see what you think. Tip number three is um, string bending as you bring the volume pedal down to cut off the tone. So let me show you what I mean. First of all, I'm going to play a tone and then quickly cut the tone off with a volume pedal. Without the delay. Okay. Now, what if I add a bend up as I'm lowering the volume pedal? So what if I, right? So maybe a half step bend, uh, one, you know, one fret bend. So let, let's try that out. Turn on the delay. So you hear how the uh, when you bring the volume pedal down quickly as you're bending, it chops off the bend. That's pretty cool. And then that brings me to my last tip for this video, and you probably heard it. As you're string bending up, you can bend up to the same note on another string that is the fixed pitch. In other words, it's not a bent string, it's just a fixed pitch. So let me show you what I mean with this uh, E string, or this E pitch, or this E note here. Okay, again, this is E, uh, fifth fret on the B string. And I'm gonna start on the G string, the third string on the seventh fret, that is a D. Okay, and I'm gonna bend up to an E, and then I'm going to very quickly move the volume pedal down and bring it back up and play the E on the fifth fret of the B string. So let's see if I can do that. Kind of cool, huh? And you probably heard the F sharp to the G. And I didn't bring the volume pedal down on that one, which is another cool effect. So what I'm doing there is bending up a half a step and then I'm letting go of the bend with my third finger as my fourth finger hits the G. Those are my tips for string bending. 
If you work on this technique, if you've not already, you know, kind of played around with it and experimented, I highly encourage you to do so. Um, I find that the judicious use of string bending with volume pedal and ambient guitar leads can add a lot of life and expression into your lead playing. Welcome to episode 23 of How to Play Ambient Guitar. On this episode, I'd like to answer a question that I've gotten a lot of over the last few years on the channel. And that question is, hey Bill, should I put my volume pedal before or after my distortion pedal in the signal chain? And I think that is a great question because where you place your volume pedal in relationship to your distortion pedal really makes a big difference in the sound. So let's check it out. Get to work. All right, uh, on the floor, let me review the uh, pedals in use. I'm going from my guitar into a compressor, the Blue Wampler Ego. From there, I currently have the compressor feeding right into my distortion pedal, which is a Strymon Riverside. From that point, I'm actually going into my amp modeling unit and then the signal's coming out of the effects send into my volume pedal. And then from there, it goes on into delay and reverb. So in effect, whether you have a, an effects loop or not, in effect, the order is compressor, distortion, volume pedal. And uh, here's my clean tone real quick. All right. And then here is my distorted tone. Okay, now let me play uh, that tone with the volume pedal and then let's talk about it. So if you think about what you just heard, the distortion level is consistent. It never changes. The volume pedal just increases or reduces the overall volume of the distorted tone, but it doesn't change the gain. So listen again here. Hear how the distortion level is consistent, um, even though the volume of that distorted tone is going up and down, the actual amount of distortion is not changing. And that is what you get when you place the volume pedal after the overdrive or the distortion pedal. Make sense? So why would you place it in that uh, fashion? Well, one reason that I can think of and, and that I normally do this is because it's very good for playing leads, with, I think, for playing leads with uh, echo, delay, reverb, that type of thing. Let me show you what I mean. Okay, so you hear with the, uh, with the reverb and the delay, actually the two delays, it's two delays and a reverb, the more Ocean Machine. You can check out a review of that. I just did one recently, it's cool. Um, anyhow, with all of that ambience, you know, between the delay and reverb going on, I find it helpful to have a consistent gain that's just moving up and down in volume. In other words, a consistent level of distortion. So the thickness of the tone doesn't change. It, whoops, it just gets louder or softer. So it's a nice consistent tonality all through the lead playing. So that's the first way that you can do this. 
I'm gonna go ahead and rewire this thing and let's check it out in the other order. All right, through the magic of video, I've instantly rewired my setup. And as you can see, I now I'm going from my Wampler Ego compressor to the volume pedal to the Strymon Riverside. And here's the clean tone. Pretty much the same as the other order. And when I add in the uh, delays and reverbs, All right, so all good there. So let's kick in the overdrive. I'm not actually gonna kick it in. Let's turn it on and let's see what we get. Now, <laughs> that's a different sound, isn't it, than the, uh, the other setup. So you can hear that the gain structure actually changes as I increase the volume. There's not as much distortion as the sound begins to increase in volume. And if you happen to, like I'm doing here a little bit, if you happen to um, use the volume pedal, if you rock it back and forth very quickly, you can almost get a trumpet kind of a sound. And let me go ahead and put the reverb and the delays in. That actually is a pretty cool sound, isn't it? Now, I said I normally have my effects pedals lined up in the other direction with the distortion before the volume pedal, but I do occasionally flip the order around into this configuration when I want that more trumpet kind of, trumpet kind of sound. And, you know, it's a lot like... Uh, in this configuration, it's a lot like just using the volume knob on your guitar. Right, so let me turn let me turn the goodies on here. Okay, let's try the volume pedal. So there you have it. There, there's a couple, a couple different ways to skin this cat. And like I said at the beginning of the video, they both have very different sounds. Now, which one is right? Which one should you go with? Well, I think it depends on the sound that you're looking for. If you want a more consistent gain structure without the distortion level kind of going up and down, then put your volume pedal after the distortion or overdrive. If your overdrive um, reacts well to, you know, like volume controls and things like that, and you want that variable distortion level, then you might want to consider putting the volume pedal before your overdrive. If you have more than one overdrive, here's another idea. You might want to put one before the uh, volume pedal and one after the volume pedal. So volume pedals in, in between the two, and that way, you have the best of both worlds. You can go, you know, either direction, whatever you're feeling like or whatever the song requires. If you've not already done so, I would love it if you would subscribe to Chords of Orion. I've got ambient guitar-related content coming every week. Tips and tricks, equipment demos, and performance videos of some of my music. Speaking of my music, if you haven't already done so, you can check it out on Spotify, Apple Music, iTunes, Bandcamp. I'll put all the links there for you to, uh, to click on. And as always, I'll see all of you on the next video.